about so, doing an LSD. I, I really enjoy doing an LSD in kind of fucked up places. Like my, some of my favorite places are airports and casinos. And it's, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm on the journey through Dante's Inferno and Virgil. You're a mad like, Look at all this twisted, fucked up shit. And I'm like, yeah, Virgil. I'm like, what's deeper, man? When I was, we are alive, by the way. Just say so you no. Know. <laughs> when I was like 16 or 17, I took shrooms and I went to Caesar's Palace. And uh, back, I don't know if they still have it, but back then they had this sh- this show where they have these fountains with these Greek god statues, and they come out. They're animatronics, so they come out of nowhere and move and talk and like. Zeus is yelling at Athena and I thought I was hallucinating the entire thing you know what I mean and it was like one of the scariest moments of my life like I had entered like Greek mythological hell like I was in the underworld or something like it was wild I mean I guess it depends what you're after but so if you're if you're after like a crazy fucked up fear and loathing type of thing then sure go to like a super stimulating environment and just try to keep your shit together I guess but that's that's never been what I've been after on the psychedelic side of things, you know, like I go for complete isolation, most likely in nature and like all, all non-natural stimulation to a minimum because, well, one, I I mean, I think the primary reason is because I'm trying to see what the experience is like absent stimulation, not piling it on and just like being over overloaded. Um, But to each their own, Eric, I guess you're at least. I I, I like both. I, I was just gonna ask, like, do you like to party on it? Because like I'm I really like no. to have my deep spiritual individual in the forest quiet, but I also love to just, you know, go to crazy ass festivals and like have the bass blaring in my face, you know, vibrating me out of existence. <laughs> I I used to party on it a lot when I was younger and uh it was fun at first until it just started being bad trip after bad trip after bad trip. So I had to I had to stop eventually you know yeah my first the answer to your question for me eric is no i don't like partying on it at all uh there's too many there's too many unknowns uh but but the first time like i really came to psychedelics was as a result of not necessarily a party it was just me and a few of the guys hanging out we were like being silly you know but we like i i overdosed us that's the wrong term i like double dosed us and we had a way more powerful trip than we were anticipating and it just brought me to like <clears throat> the weird dark place and i was like fuck what like what is going on what is this this ain't so fun and that that's what started my journey of like figuring out what that experience was all about and how to use it properly but uh yeah there's just too many unknowns and too many weird things can happen to throw you off kilter in the uh, environments like that and i'm like i'm also not a i'm not a partier really anymore as lame as that sounds i don't like i don't rave or any shit like that i barely drink kind of boring i guess no i mean (laughs) i i only do it in a specific and focused context when you know i know there's going to be excellent djs i can commit myself to it my kids are taken care of so it happens every every few years so me and Ashley went to a really great festival a couple of weeks ago, and it's exactly what I needed for life. So, yeah, and it was also nice because I just forgot, uh, I just forgot like how much I can really enjoy that vibe and just listening to the music and just really enjoy existing. I, I don't, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic of it's it, it's a very similar to like the the deep spiritual stuff, but like kind of on this like fun playful side. Yeah, that well, makes. Makes perfect sense. Um, I guess the last time I partied like that was in t- at Tomorrowland in 2018. Mm. We didn't uh, we didn't do psychedelics. We did a little a little Molly, but uh, that was the last time I, I guess I really partied like that. It's wonderful, but yeah. You don't consider not, Molly psychedelic? Not really. Not a classic psychedelic because it's more yeah. of a like it's more like an embodied sensation than a psycho spiritual sort of thing at least as far as my experience with it is has been um but yeah, yeah the, only I mean, it, I, the only time i ever did molly i i mixed it with shrooms so i have no idea what ooh. it even feels like uh but i know Mick, when you mix it with shrooms it shit gets weird as fuck <laughs> i bet i bet no i mean like yeah. with molly so much can like you have to make sure that the source is good right because you can you can have garbage and you don't want to be putting garbage in your system and taking all that risk but if it's like pure 
it's a wonderful, loving experience, and which is, I guess, part of the reason why there's so much, you know, MAPS has been doing all that work and trying to get it um, available for, I think, initially, uh, PT, um, yeah, PTSD. Yeah, so, so, but MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. And I, I think this might even be the year that they get past stage three clinical trials and get it into like available treatments. I'm not sure what the current status is, but I think that was the, that was the last I heard of it. Um, Does that mean it'll be available for prescription? I think so. I, well, prescription I, th I may think not be, be like the right in, word, but hmm. yeah, like a, like a, I think it has to be done like in a therapeutic context. Yeah, and oh, okay. presuming that the, the proper therapists are available in your area and all that kind of stuff. But I, I do think that's the idea. Like you'll be able to, like a, some sort of, like a primary care physician or someone will be able to write a treatment for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, um, which is great because, the, the, you know, the, I know, Eric, you're somewhat, I think, uh, critical of the medicalization of all this stuff. And I think I we can have a chat about that, but just as a baseline that that, first of all, it's been so successful. I mean, it got fast tracked. It got, what, what, what's the designation that the FDA gives? Um, breakthrough therapy status is what they gave it because it was so effective at treating PTSD. And I think also treatment resistant depression was the other one that they had done the trials on and it had like insane results. And so that's why they gave it that status. And, but even so it's been like, I think MAPS has been working on it for 20 years. So fast tracking through the FDA is like, you know, not that, not all that fast, but yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like it's tremendously uh, beneficial for those sorts of people. And I, once you do it in the, in the right setting, you can understand why, because it's, you know, such a like heart opening uh, experience. And I guess in conjunction with a capable psychotherapist, you can really work through some stuff that otherwise you might have some like, pretty severe blockages to access. Mm. Yeah. I mean, my experience with it is that like, you're like all of the defenses, even if you want them, like they go away. And, and I, I consider like out of all of the different uh, things I've experimented with, like, I think Molly is like the most quote unquote dangerous just because uh, like if you're, if you're with the wrong people and that barrier is down, like it's really easy to bond to them when maybe you shouldn't be. And it, it just presents a, a lot of, you have to be very critical about your approach to it. And if you're sloppy about that, you can cause for a lot of problems. But well, I, I mean, think I think it's great that more people get to experience these things. Totally. I think it's also dangerous because it's exclusively positive, pretty much. Or at least like the, the sensation is so positive. Whereas psychedelics, I mean, you kind of have to work for it. Like, you know, you don't just take it and it's like, um, like blissful. Like you take it and you encounter the reality of of who you are and the reality of reality in many senses and like that can be terrifying so you know it's not something that as soon as you come out you're like yeah let's dive back in right away next weekend because that was just purely positive it's like it's a far more uh far more of a like a hero's journey sort of experience than just you know taking something and being delivered to a positive experience mm. yeah. rob i'm just me uh, reading your message here you're Chopping out every five or seven seconds, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what it's like if you guys can hear me, but <clears throat> I did a pod the other day with a couple of guys. It was Svetsky and Moss. We had to switch to Riverside because I have 50 megabyte per second up and down, but for some reason at this, I don't know. Weird. <clears throat> yeah, you, you're you coming through sound. relatively clear. We're just hearing like a few gaps. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just, yeah. So just know that I might miss a few important things you dude say. <laughs> We're going to use it to troll what's, you. What's new with you? You've been pumping out content like crazy. How are they? Yeah. Yeah. Working on the show. Um, to, and then I've been traveling a little bit, but I'm headed towards Nashville. So kind of moving back there on a semi permanent basis which I'm from Tennessee. So it's like going back home for me. Going to a little Bitcoin Mecca as well. It's got to be exciting. What's that? <laughs> you going to a Bitcoin Mecca? 
Yeah, one Bit- of the Bitcoin, one of the Bitcoin like a, Yeah, that's that's another aspect of it. And um, I'm be back in the south. People are sane there, so that'll be good. Nice. Good to plug into a culture that doesn't comply. <clears throat> I saw nuts. you just. I saw you just um, turn your sailor series into a book. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's just. It's essentially a transcript of the conversation with just some some. But yeah, material for people that prefer to read, like me. Yeah. Your uh, audio is a little bit shittier now. <laughs> I yeah I don't think this is gonna get better guys. Can we do I don't Twitter Space? I don't know what other options are there. I have no idea. I always use this. Does Riverside uh, allow you to stream? I don't know. The thing about Riverside that works is that it recorded locally, so when there were gaps, you could still catch later. your audio. Yeah. What's yeah. that other one you've used before, John? Like Restreamer? No, Restream is just what I use to live stream this i use zencaster oh, okay. for the ct pod because oh, yeah. that just we don't live stream it and it just records locally but <clears throat> that's kind of not fun and it requires i could try work, and work take me afterwards somewhere to a starbucks or something i could try to take my phone down to a starbucks or something and then dial in yeah do that shit see if it works all right i'll see you guys in a few yeah, be, no be yelling at people like get all be, angry at starbucks yeah it'll be great yeah if you had background noise, it would be fine as long as we could like hear you coming through. Oh, there we I go. I want to see Rob fly off the handle in Starbucks and have like people behind him being like, who's this weirdo? What's he, what's he talking about? <laughs> I can't imagine Rob flying off the handle about much. You know what I mean? Like, could you Me imagine either. Rob like really volatile, like emotionally volatile? Probably not. No, but I yeah. kind of want to see it because he'd probably wreck house. You know, he's a yeah, yeah. large, large Thor motherfucker, you know, so he could probably. Fuck some people up. Yo, so how are you guys handling the bear market? You doing good? Bear market check-in? Everyone's sane? Everything okay? <sighs> Never I mean, better, man. Never better. My fucking contractor, I orange-pilled him, which is awesome. But, like, the market crash, he's like, yeah, like, pay me everything, like, in Bitcoin. And I'm like, uh, okay. You? you sure you don't want cash? <laughs> he's like, no, no, I want, I want Bitcoin. I'm like, right. <laughs> hey. Howdy, here you go. I, uh, I, mean, that, I, I, I orange pilled my therapist and then the market crashed. So, uh, haven't been back to therapy, you know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Reach out to him, he'll be like, fuck you. How about that? How, how's that for some help? Go get fucked. I'm sorry. sorry. I mean, bear market's good for me. Like, I, I always like the bear market because. One, it fucks all the morons, um, yeah. which like there are a lot more that needs to happen. Um, but like this tornado cash thing has been hilarious to watch for, for ETH to like immediately become like compliant chain. Um, yeah, I don't know. I always like bear markets because everybody shuts up and gets back to work and it makes life easier. Have I told you my theory about, uh, you know, what you just said about it being compliant chain? I think basically that uh, the amount of downward pressure on Ethereum in particular and basically all of the shit coins that are actually securities is going to be to add an AML KYC layer. And I think that Ethereum is going to have no problem adding that because they have no defensibility. Like they can't tell regulators to pound sand because it's very easy to capture Ethereum, right? So basically they have to add it. And I think the way they're going to do it is they're going to spin it to the public in this way that's like, we've created decentralized identity solutions for blah, blah, blah. And it's the next big bubble, I think, in shitcoin land is going to be this identity bubble because they're going to spin this negative into a positive in order to sell shitcoins to the public. This is sort of like my working thesis at the moment. I think we're going to see it develop over the next couple of years. And this tornado catch is just sort of the beginning of it, in my opinion. Wait, say that again. How how do they make it a positive? So, yeah, basically, like, regulators are going to force them to have an AML KYC layer. Like, if you listen to, like, Sailor talk, I think he has a very sober take on this, which is that regulators don't want to ban Bitcoin or crypto assets. What they want to do is they want to dox everybody and they want to tax everybody. And you can't tax everybody unless you dox everybody. So step one is dox everybody, right? And in Bitcoin, there's nobody that you can like subpoena, but you can easily subpoena like high level Ethereum leadership. And also like most of Ethereum's uh, infra is run in the cloud. 
And like, if you see, you know, when Parler got deplatformed, Vitalik Buterin was on Twitter being like, uh, you know, this is terrible. This is censorship, yada, yada, because he knows it can happen to him. Right. And so they're going to be forced to add this layer and they're going to spin it to the public as a positive why they're adding. There, so it's basically going to be all these decentralized identity solutions. It'll be like social capitalism. They'll say they're investing in each other. I don't know the exact shape of how it's going to take place because I can't get inside the mind of a retard, but I know that this is coming, you know? That sounds yeah. like close to CBDC territory too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, and this is how you also frame it up to be like, we're like regulated safe Ethereum who like loves you and wants to make sure terrorism doesn't happen and that the yep. environment isn't destroyed. Unlike the Bitcoiners who yeah. want to fund terrorism and want to destroy the environment, you pieces of shit. So, so that's, that's absolutely right. Because here's what I never anticipated when I first look at Ethereum during the pre-sale. I was like, this thing has no defensibility. Obviously, like it can totally be captured. And then... I didn't even realize they want to be captured by the state. That's what they want. That's what their end goal is. And once that came into focus for me, I was like, oh, shit. Now it all makes sense. The proof of stake attack. The reason the Ethereum people are. Can everybody hear how? No. no, I can't hear him at all. This is oh, great. I love well. that he's like going through all of his reasons <laughs> and like we can't keep any right. of them. And he's going to get to the end and he's going to be like, and that's and why my thesis works. We're, we're, that was a great huddle, but we lost most of it. So did you mute yourself or? Yeah, you seem like you muted yourself. It's all right. I still love you. Just less. Oh, he fell. We're doing, we're doing good here today. <laughs> <laughs> the the tech, tech support hall hang. <laughs> the internet well, in you, major American cities sharing what it used to be. Yeah. Everything's fine. I'm, I'm like out here in the middle of fucking nowhere and like I'm actually doing pretty okay. It's yeah. Nice. You're coming. You're, are you on the, um, the Starlink right now? Yeah, yeah. It's it's the same spot. I just had a new dish because my contract finally isn't get up that really... tree or get somebody up that tree. No, no, same pole. It's just a new dish that that works better. Right. But I'll climb oh, the tree look, eventually. You're, I just you're like want to climb the tree at this point. Thank you, John. You look good too. I miss you, John. I miss <laughs> your smell, the rich mahogany, the deep. I miss all, I miss all you guys. That's why we do this. Otto, you back? Can we hear you now? Did, did I, where did I cut out? I cut out. Like when one. you started in your reason, you're like, number yeah. one. God, I was on such a good rant, man. <laughs> God damn it. Do you want to? I, mean, uh, I have to point out how funny is it that it? the thing called Tornado Cash literally became a tornado that was throwing cash at people to try to. I mean, like, this stuff keeps happening. And, like, this, this to me is how, like, God's like, uh, his like slapstick humor. He's like, let's have all this crazy shit happen where it's obvious by the name how this is going to fail. Dude, it's safe, safe moon. That that currency took oh. off because people were like, well, like it's safe and it goes to the moon. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the whole thought it? process. Brando has electrolytes. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <That's... laughs> yeah, I just... Every, it's like everyone has to be constantly reminded why Bitcoin exists and why it exists in the form it exists. And you can't, like even in Bitcoin, within Bitcoin land, and, you know, everyone's waiting on a spot ETF and all this, you know, hoopla around BlackRock, or whatever the fuck it is. It's like, are you, it's going to, the same shit's going to happen. Eventually, those people get rugged. You tell me if you put $10 billion, $50 billion into a spot ETF. You think that's what Bitcoin's about? You don't think that that's a honeypot for a regulator or for the, the custodian or for whomever? Like, you're getting all these people excited about having Bitcoin exposure. And then you're just, you're, it's a big rug pull eventually. You like, 
Do you think that's not going to eventually be a rug pull? Do you think everyone's going to like wise up over time? But well, I'll just get spotty ETF exposure now. And eventually I'll learn how to take custody and I'll do that whole thing. and I'll become Never. a full fledged Bitcoiner. No, you're just, no. You're, you're making it seem as though people can own Bitcoin without actually owning Bitcoin and without actually taking advantage of, of the advantages that Bitcoin and the value that Bitcoin represents. And you're just recreating the same shit. Like what's the difference between a spot ETF and, and gold certificates? Not I mean, much, right? Yeah. This is, I mean, this is fucking hysterical that it's like, check it out. You have this like self-sovereign piece of software that can allow for you independent wealth sovereignty. And people are fucking dumb enough to go put that with an institution that like all throughout human history, they have provenly robbed people. And then like people go and fucking do it again. I mean, like Celsius is the perfect deal. Yeah. People are like, well, wow, like 8% interest, like that's great. Like, oh shit, I like lost all my money. How could have I ever known? And it's like, oh, well, if we like referenced any of the fucking dozens of bank failures throughout all of human history, maybe we'd have some idea. And it's just, yeah. I don't know. Like, I love how... I love how like this word crypto has literally lost all meaning and it comes to represent this total vacancy that has nothing to do with cryptography. It's fucking funny. Well, you know, it's, it's weird. I mean, one thing I don't worry about this because uh, I think one of Satoshi's uh, like moments of brilliance is the speed of the supply issuance. So there's already 19 million Bitcoin out there. Most of it is in the hands of people who do take self custody very seriously. Right. And so I don't I don't like worry about it from a systemic point of view, but I think it is interesting that like, you know, we've seen throughout gold's history that people will continually offload the risk to others, whether it's for the promise of, uh, you know, financial gain or whether it's because they're scared of losing it on their own or, you know, it's just too cumbersome or they get uh, browbeaten into it or gaslit into it, uh, you know, be a bad law or the government government steal whatever like there's all these things that happen and uh i think like you know the the hodl culture that we that we are instilling we do instill in ourselves and in our children and the people that come later is basically like no you never give this up here's what hodlers do like there's been all this talk about bitcoin maximalism and all this shit right okay this is what hodlers do we just say no you know hey give me your bitcoin no hey do this no <laughs> I don't have to do anything. Sell me your Bitcoin for $23,000. No, I'm not. No, no. It's all no. Just no. We just say no forever. That's what we do. Okay. This is the root word of sovereignty. Like if you mm -hmm. can say no, you're sovereign. If you can't say no, yeah. then you're non-sovereign. And the, the crazy thing to me is that, you know, you hear a lot of talk and, you know, well-meaning people are trying to develop solutions for, you know, making Bitcoin more accessible to people, you know, like what brings on the next billion hodlers and how do we make this easier for people? And like the proposition is 12 words for your freedom and 12 words to contribute to the freedom of the world, right? As we know, like, let's say if in a hypothetical, if everyone's wealth is completely sovereign unto themselves and can't be accessed by anybody else, then the world becomes voluntary and the state shrinks massively if it even you know, continues to exist at all in its current form. And, you know, we, we all know that story, but like all of that is on the other half of 12, on the other side of remembering and being able to secure 12 words. And still people are like, no, people are never going to do that. So we have to like make concessions here or there. It's like, are you fucking, what? Like we, we have this insane, never before proposed opportunity to people to, to, uh, to gain access to a degree of sovereignty that no human alive, nor any human as a part of a society or a community or whatever, has ever had access to. And all it requires of you is to remember 12 words. And they're like, whoa, no, no, no. We got to figure <laughs> out a way around this. That's not going to work. Remembering 12 words is not worth, or all that freedom is not worth remembering 12 words and whatever I have to do to make it redundant and all that kind of shit. It's like, it's going to be seen so absurd in the future <laughs> that like, people were trying to work around that. And, you know, Eric, I think you've talked about this before, but I think in the future, ultimately, and we'll make all the mistakes and all the custodians and all the workarounds uh, that are currently taking shape, like all the hard lessons will be learned, but eventually we'll just like, we'll have a culture that prioritizes 
the means of securing and maintaining your sovereignty. And it seems to be the case that it's going to be uh, being able to custody <clears throat> your own information in some degree, whether it's always 12 words or whether that information is encoded in a different way in the future. But it's like that will be one of the fundamental rites of passage or things that you learn as someone that grows up in the world. It's like, hey, you know, like you learn how to take care of yourself. You learn how to, I don't know, like uh, you learn certain things regarding physical fitness. You know, like there are things that we have culturally ingrained that like we teach young people, or at least we want to. I mean, everything's kind of going off the rails these days. Uh, but that'll presumably be one of them, one of the most important. And it won't be seen as like this big, hurdle to overcome it's just like yeah sure 12 words for my freedom it's like the fucking best deal ever proposed to anyone so sure like let's figure out how to do that instead of of all these workarounds that seem to be emerging today it's like look i get it like not everyone's ready to take that degree of responsibility that doesn't mean you should water down like what's available to them it's just maybe it happens slower than you want it to happen maybe you know people take that responsibility less people take that responsibility on, on a longer or on a different time horizon that, that you're hoping for. But, you know, there, there's, mm -hmm. uh, let's just say this, there's no, there's no alternative, right? You're either <clears throat> taking full sovereignty or you're not. And I think a lot of people these days are being uh, convinced that there's like, you can go halfway or you can water it down. And I feel like that's a recipe for ultimate wreckage. It's pretty embarrassing too. I mean, like, like I can't underline that. More. Like people, like twelve work. Like this is impossible. Like <laughs> we just got to move on with the the war machine that kills hundreds of thousands of people and it exploits the entire world's population. That's just the. It's just easier than remembering your twelve words. And I mean, like it. Well, I'm like I hope like it's funny now, but like I actually feel a very deep sense of anger. Like, how fucking dare you? Like, like you were saying, John, like we have this extremely radical tool. And it's funny, as I read more Heidegger, like I'm becoming more and more convinced that like, this is the fundamental human event of, you know, humanity at this point in time, because it, it moves us from my <laughs> daughter's screen, from analog to, to a digital world. And like in that conversion, a new form of sovereignty that's totally provable, that's never existed before, becomes accessible. And it's all predicated upon a form of knowledge that we can all access. I mean, like that, that's right. fucking it, extraordinary. It, isn't it bad? It just doesn't it seem on its face so absurd that like the narrative that at least some people are being told, it's like, like you're not capable of that. All of that good stuff that you just mentioned and the simple fact that it's, you know, it's accessible by remembering and, and you know, custodian, custodying 12 words, you're not capable of that. So we're going to have to find another way around it. Like, it's just, it's so yeah. crazy. I, I do well, think like, there take are a these step back people. At, oh, go ahead, I, I was just going to say, like, it's crazy, but like, take a step back. Like, there's an 80 year old geriatric man who has Alzheimer's, who's like running the most powerful country in the world. Like, they're... <laughs> There are children that are like repeatedly bombed for no reason other than like they're in the wrong fucking location. And we refuse to pull it. Like when you look at how absurd everything is, like why the fuck shouldn't sovereign internet money come to run the world? Because like the rest of this other stuff is so batshit crazy. So like, why not? Like, let's just go deeper into the fucking craziness, right? Except let's not go so crazy that maybe doggy money runs the show. I, uh, I, I do think that there are these people, you know, I mean, 19 million Bitcoin have been mined, right? So like the people who end up acquiring the last 2 million Bitcoin, um, they've been alive on the planet for quite some time because these Bitcoin are expensive now, right? But they're just not capable of self-sovereignty. So I'm going to refer to them as baby coiners. And I think for the baby coiners, you basically need shared risk models. Like I think Fediments are a good example of that. And there will be more uh, different types of shared risk models. And I, I'm not necessarily like, I agree with you, Eric. Like, I, it's like, it is kind of pathetic that you need that, but like also some people need it. So fuck it. Like there will exist this small slice of the market that has these shared risk models. And I think there are, some of them are good trade-offs and some of them are bad trade-offs and people are going to learn what is and is not a good shared risk model, right? Like BlockFi, not a good model, right? <laughs> like that one's obvious, right? Celsius, not a good model. 
uh, you know, what was the other one? Luna, Luna. I can't, I can't remember them anymore. They come and go. There was a bunch so of fucking fast. There was a bunch of other ones though. Do we lose Eric? It's Eric's turn. <laughs> Like rotating internet. Right at the beginning of his point, too. He's like, number one. He's deep into like the fucking Heidegger says. Zoom is like canceling you guys every time you get on a roll. I know. Like the well, the the, the NSA is like, we gotta stop, we gotta stop these huddle hang guys. They're they're putting too much crazy <laughs> shit out there. So like get get on the zoom and make sure that they cut out a whole bunch. But Hado, like, isn't it, like you said, not everyone's capable of self custody Isn't it just crazy that we're at a point where we've inculcated in people in this culture or civilization the delegation of so much responsibility that the idea of being, of you being the sole person yeah. responsible for 12 words that gives you access to all of your wealth and as a result, most of your sovereignty and most of your capability to move through the world, construct the life you want, whatever we, you know, whatever money actually does, that that's like just pre-presumed to be off limits to a pretty big portion of the population just by virtue of the fact that they're incapable of taking that degree of responsibility. Dude, I, uh, I've, I've talked about this before, but when I made my very first Bitcoin transaction on chain, I had this like sense of panic and like fear that came over me like i was like oh yeah we've all this that. is all on me i'm responsible for this right like if i send this off into cyberspace and it goes to the wrong place it's not coming back to me and then when i sent it and it arrived where it was supposed to arrive and i had gone through the procedure correctly that feeling of fear flipped to a feeling of empowerment and i was like yeah. oh shit I can do this. This is me, baby. Let's go. And then, then it was like the light bulb was on in my head. You know? Dude, yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. Like every, every fucking day that I worked at Coinbase, I had to like resolve accounts where like I had to like send money to people. And it was like that over and over and over. like, and sometimes these were like <laughs> really large amounts of money too. So it's like you fling the transaction. You're like, okay, like fucking confirm. <laughs> and then there's like a there was one time there was like a two hour block drought and I was I was just like motherfucker I was like there's so much Bitcoin writing here please yeah. fucking confirm and then it did and you're like thank fucking god and like we always had people like double check us but it was always like I was always just afraid that I was really gonna fuck myself but thankfully I've only destroyed like a tenth of a Bitcoin and that was like quite a while ago and that was right after uh, the block wars with like the Bcash shit. Yeah. I, I, uh, I analogize <laughs> this to driving a car. There was a time when we were all scared teenagers who didn't know how to operate a motor vehicle and you were in the parking lot with like your parent or somebody and you were just like, oh shit, here I go. Ah! You know, whatever, right? <laughs> That's what it's like to operate Bitcoin. But it's, it's like still... Bitcoin. And, and furthermore, like now that you can drop, like you can, you know, like yeah, you now can be like pretty tired yeah. and go drive and like not fucking destroy you're like, yourself. You're and, eating like, a cheeseburger. You're texting. You're like a little drunk. You're like, I'm fine. I can just <laughs> fucking do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, this is the twelve words thing is really interesting because you guys obviously super focused on the brain wallet. And I think the brain wallet's important, but don't you think we need multi sig? We do need. We yeah. do need these distributed risk models for se secession planning and all that. Man, well, when so, I say, so, go ahead, John. Uh, when I say twelve, I mean like, I mean your responsibility to either remember them or make sure you always have access <clears throat> to them by making them redundant in some way. Um, oh, okay, so you're putting all I, that under the twelve words. Yeah, although okay. like, I mean, sure you know, brain walls don't work for if anything happens to you, like if that's the exclusive place it is, you know, so that's probably for most people uh, ill-advised. But I think just like the like the main philosophical point maybe is just that like, that's all it's it ultimate is. Ownership. It, bo it boils down to that. Like you can have, you know, complete financial sovereignty and all the other sovereignty that that enables just by remembering 12 words and you taking, and like the responsibility for that is not only just remember them, remembering them, but like you said, like figuring out a way to make sure that if you forget them, you still have access to them. But like, think about how just, it just seems, I can't get over it. It's, it's 12 words. It's 12 little bits of information. You're not, 
like you don't have to dedicate your life to something. You don't have to like build something massive. You don't have to continually do something like it's 12 words for sovereignty for the rest of your life. And people are like, bro, <laughs> can't, can't do it. I, like, you know, I'm just, I can't take that, I would take that it a, responsibility. I'd take it a step further and say, yeah, it's sovereignty over your own life and it can be all of your wealth, but it's also this uncompromisable intergenerational wealth. Yeah. Cause now you can take that information and pass it on. Right. And it can be passed on forever. Really. If you do it right. And it's not, so in that way, it's not just it, your wealth because Bitcoin then becomes a slice of global purchasing power forever. So it's like you're, you know, in out of 21 million slice of all global productivity intergenerationally forever. Yeah. It's, um, it's crazy. It's unbelievable. And the price you pay, what's the price? 12 words. You can literally put 12 words in your mind. That's a pretty low bar. It's insanely low. And the, the fact that like we're this big ongoing discussion of trying to figure out how to make it lower, but you know, in yeah. making it lower, you, you undo the benefit, right? Like you, you having a uh, Bitcoin with BlackRock or a spot ETF doesn't deliver what you just mm. described at right. all. And this is, I think it's kind of ironic in a way because, so I always call this inviolable property, but you could also call it the perfection of ownership, right? The, fi fi the first time you can own something that's independent of everyone else's opinions about you owning the thing. And um, that's ironic to me because that's why governments exist, really. It's like to make ownership a thing, right? The fact that you have a title to your car and a deed to your house and even like your even your birth records and whatnot, which are used to tax you. But so that's the purpose of government itself is to just make um, this idea of property or ownership itself actually work in the real world. And this thing emerges that is, I guess, just the, just the ultimate form of ownership that undermines that whole structure in a way. So we move from this world where it's all promises, it's all counterparties, it's all opportunities for arbitrage, for fraud. And you just, you close that whole gap because there's no more dependency on paper bullshit promises to your wealth. You just have direct and total integrated access to it if you custody it right. It's crazy. As, well, as somebody who's, who's a Bitcoiner and who thinks like, you know, we think, uh, you know, and is comfortable with like cryptographic primitives. Like when I'm operating the world and, you know, doing a real estate transaction or something, and they're like, sign these papers and attest to the fact that you're not lying. It's like, what? That makes no <laughs> sense. I'm just supposed to write down that I'm not lying. And that's enough for you. That's nothing. That's nothing. That's zero. You know, like, <laughs> uh, to quote Jay-Z, men lie, women lie, numbers don't, you know, it's like and Bitcoin is doesn't lie. Every Bitcoin and transaction so, is the truth. So good. The whole fiat complex, like the whole thing, I think was built on, and this is why I always try to go back to gold. It's just hard to self-custody gold. So we had to put a bunch of paper promises on top of this whole fucking system, and it's infected everything in the world now. The whole world is, you know, like I said, like this counterparty complex. Yeah. And when this thing starts to blow up, you know, I've been reading this book recently about the Bank of England, and when they would have blow-ups, First thing they do is suspend convertibility of gold. Then they would go in and jack up interest rates, just artificially increase interest rates to draw in gold deposits. So basically pulling the Celsius tactic, offering your customers <clears throat> yield to draw in deposits. And so I've been thinking a little bit about that. Like what, what, who's going to start doing that? Like mm. this is going to be central banks trying to take custody of Bitcoin at some oh, point yeah. or some other organization like, oh, we'll give you 10% on your Bitcoin forever. And we're the government. Oh, yeah. Whatever perpetual promise. They're going to try to use these promises that we are built on right now. Everyone's going to try to use these different structures of promises for, to try to get your Bitcoin, which is another way of saying everyone's a scammer. So yeah. you have and to like, have the 12 words. <laughs> I want to fucking scream because like the, the fucking motto, don't trust verify, is like a, a real goddamn thing. And it's like fucking important. And I mean, like I, I was thinking about you know, like the most natural thing is, is as as sovereign individuals, we like own our body, but like the state has created this entire fucking ridiculous idea that like we need birth certificates and other things and we don't actually own ourselves. 
And so Bitcoin is just like returning us all the way to the beginning of acknowledging that actually there is nothing at all except for us. And through the knowledge form that we can access vis-a-vis Bitcoin and the cryptography it gives us access to, mm. like we're at we're at a total end game. Because like if cryptography continues to operate the way that we believe it does, you know, like this thing's fucking unbreakable for the rest of human history. And so it's so profound to get to participate in this. And I just I can't wait to be like an old fucking geezer and I'll be like. Like in Damn like the early 2020s and i'll be like oh like everybody was fucking retarded they were like telling us that that they like loved us and they're like printing out money to like make everybody rich and like all these fucking morons believed it you know and then gas went to 50 dollars, and eggs were 300 dollars a carton and blah 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 I, I think if you look at uh you know what rob was talking about like the risk of confiscation basically um it reminds <laughs> me of like you know uh plato y plomo like silver or lead and i think that's the approach that um uh, you know, elite institutions are going to take is the carrot or stick approach. So basically, they're going to offer you, you know, incentives, uh, if you give up your Bitcoin willingly, like, and those will be, in the short term, actually, rather good financial incentives. Uh, Or they're going to, you know, take the stick approach, which is like, uh, hey, John, we saw you made a transaction on the Silk Road in 2013, and you didn't pay your taxes. And now we're going back and auditing you. And we have 87,000 new IRS agents. So go fuck yourself. Uh, You can either take this deal or you can jump off a bridge, right? And so I think like, it will be important to sort of attempt to walk the middle path uh, as we enter into that world and make it through that relatively unscathed with your Bitcoin on the other side. And you mean how you as do a that is anyone's guess. As a Bitcoiner, walk the middle path. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, as a Bitcoiner. As a hodler. You know, you want to still be hodling at the end of it all, right? People come oh. to you with promises. People come to you with this. People come to you with that. Your job as a sovereign person is just say, hmm, no, no. Yeah. I just I, I, mean, I, I mean, that's why everyone think, is sc- everyone's a scammer. It was so, so brilliant, yeah. you know? Shout out to Bitstein. But uh, this is the thing, like... <clears throat> what's the end game for all, all of these institutions? You know, they're basically, I think, and pe- many people have said this before, but I think it's best to just presume they're proxies for all, you know, ultimate state confiscation. Like hmm. if this plays out the way we think it's going to play out and it can, you know, Bitcoin and people being able to custody their own wealth, it ultimately starves the state of its means of its own survival of executing on its own imperatives, let's say, then, it's only natural that they'll go to all areas where wealth is concentrated so that they can, you know, in desperate attempts to continue to fund themselves. And, you know, an institution is the easiest, like, you know, pick up the phone and call your buddy, Larry Fink or whomever and be like, yo, uh, do you want to go to jail or do you want to give up all that coin? So and- I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about this and I think this is one of the hand wavy things that Bitcoiners do often. And I've certainly been guilty of it myself in the past, which is, uh, you know, we we're like, and then Bitcoin, it fixes all the things, right? And one of the things I have to ask myself is like, how does Bitcoin prevent a government from printing money, especially a government that has its hands on a lot of Bitcoin? And unfortunately, the answer you come to is that it doesn't. It can slow the printing to some degree, but it can't prevent a sovereign from issuing their own fiat currency against Bitcoin, right? And so well, I do have to wonder if, and and also here's the thing, when you talk about like, the state dissolving, right? Or like us moving into a new type of state, like, you know, Balaji Srinivasan calls it the network state or whatever. I don't really know what that means. I don't think anybody knows what it means. I don't think Balaji knows what it means. But certainly there's this idea that we're directionally heading in this in this path towards more individual sovereignty, smaller state, most likely. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, nuclear warheads don't go away. And whoever has control of the nuclear warheads, guess what? They're the new state, right? So I think you you arrive at like, minarchism in your like best case scenario but some of the bitcoiners who are like it's all going away man to zero man i i don't see that reality i i I actually foresee the potential of large amounts of uh deconstructing of the nuclear weapons to actually serve as components to new nuclear reactors um Mm. i mean that's part of my own fantasy about it uh be Truth nice. is, is, like I think that's all. Maybe that's what really Trump was dumb. doing with the. Maybe that's what Trump was doing with the nuclear secret. <laughs> <laughs> He's obviously a nuclear scientist by night. You know, it, it's uh, 
Well, yeah, I mean, well, like, I, mean, I think this all gets super bad because, like, I think I think really what happens is that Bitcoiners are labeled as like the the white nationalist racists who want to use their money to destroy the environment. I think we'll get sixty one oh two. I think the government will demand all transactions throughout all history from us. Uh, and I honestly think we'll be forced back into a corner where I really hope we'll look at each other and be like, fuck it, like time to go totally fully political. Because at the end of the day, like I think at the bottom, this is all the most political thing that's ever happened. And we're so deep into clown world that we're like, yeah, like paying, paying half my income to a government that fucking hates me and wants to give all that money to a bunch of people who don't want to work and want to use that money to create missiles to kill brown people who just want to be left alone. Like, it's so fucking wacky and insane and upsetting. And, like, I I don't even know what to do because we, we you know, I, I get that we can start trying to organize and stuff, but I, I think this all ends really poorly for, at least for me personally. But I, I don't know. I... I <laughs> I feel this, like I really put why, myself in the target. Well, this is this is why you can't wait to let yourself be backed into a corner by people who hate you, who have their knives sharpened, you know, who are out to get you, right? Like in America, here's one of the great things about America. In America, money is speech and Bitcoin is money. Okay. So like people that have money, they get their voices listened to, and the government better reflects their views and their ideologies and what they want to see happen in the world. So the time to get politically active is is now, right? Like I get when people go, I don't know, bro, I'm moving to St. Lucia, man. I'm just going to fucking drink coconuts and then die early or whatever. I, that's fine for you, dude. But uh, I'm very, you know, interested in what happens in America over the next hundred years. Like very interested. So in that and way, I'm going to be here for it. The stacking sats is actually getting involved in politics. Yeah. Because you're accumulating more energy for your political voice at this moment of ultimate face off that may or may not come to pass um it's interesting you know I, I i don't know i think we maybe underestimate the associated enlightenment maybe some of us overestimate it like myself maybe john but um that book we're reading uh the history of religious ideas that one thing i texted you about where every time the tech changes there's like this mythological mm. echo behind it and mm -hmm. so all the imaginary structures change and we, you know, the most recent one we saw was like the Enlightenment. That was a pretty clear one. We had the printing press and calculus and all these like software updates in our in our cognitive structure. So I, I'm really fascinated to keep watching that to see how fast that plays out. We see it play out at the individual level to some extent. I think, you know, in this group alone, um, but to see how fast that manifests at the collective will be fascinating. That's like a counterforce to this whole final judgment day of the state thing, right? You've got this intransigent minority of Bitcoiners getting more, more and more rich over time, which means their political voice is louder and louder in the U.S., as Hoddle says, and it's facing off against this legacy structure that's much more static, much less adaptive. So, I mean, let me, the battle is yes, on the ideological yes and, plane. Let me yes and this. Yes, uh, when the printing press came out, the Enlightenment swept Europe. Right. And in the end, it was a beautiful thing. And, you know, we got all of modern Western culture out of it and it was necessary. In the space between there, every aristocracy in Europe was beheaded and it was very like extremely turbulent. And I think we're living in the early part, like the first inning of that. And uh, it's kind of terrifying, but exciting. We'll see what happens. The the new question is like one I think about a lot. And I, I don't know how the world handles the existence of like massive nuclear stockpiles because wh whoever controls them, when they get desperate, what do they do? All that stuff, you know? And I just, maybe there's, and what, what are you supposed to think about that? But to your point, Rob, like, yes, we, you know, we, in this group, we do talk a lot about how Bitcoin you know, much more than just like a way to store value ends up becoming like a perceptive lens for how you see yourself and how you see the world and, and you know, your aspirations for it and all that kind of stuff is very transformative. And at the end of the day, like there is no government, right? There's just people that are choosing to engage in certain behaviors and other people that are choosing to engage in others. And the reasons for that are conditioning and incentives and, you know, all that stuff. And so, 
if that can change, then I, I think all of these structures that we give like a, a reality to can change rather quickly. Uh, but, but again, I mean, this goes back to the point we were discussing before. It's like why we have to, because Hoddle to your point about like, you know, the money, they can still print money. It's like, yeah, but the more, the, the more people that disallow theft from their wealth, then the, you know, they, you can print all you want. It's less effective, right? And this, this is the case for the Bitcoin circular economy and people custodying their own Bitcoin, because, you know, if, if you, if you only transact in Bitcoin and you custody your Bitcoin, like you're, you're creating a little Island that, you know, is, is pretty much impenetrable. Now people can have pressure be put on and that kind of stuff, which is why it's great that you can cross borders with 12 words in your head and your wealth is intact. And, you know, all these things that we, we ultimately talk about, but the punchline is, is when theft is no longer possible, what happens to the state? And the answer is like, well, how many people have, have entered that, you know, no theft zone. And right now it's a small amount, you know, so the, the quote unquote state still has a tremendous amount of power and the money printer has a tremendous amount of influence. But if more and more people would come to appreciate the, you know, the sacredness and the importance of those 12 words, then, it's not only that they're liberating their own life to varying degrees, both disallowing theft and of course, increasing their purchasing power over time, <clears throat> but contributing to, uh, yeah, the dissolution of the state on mass when enough people do that, you know? And of course it, it's gonna be, well, not of course, I suspect it'll be tumultuous. And we, we always like have the orange colored glasses on when we have these conversations and mm -hmm. it's all, it's gonna, it's gonna take many unexpected turns, but, it just seems like that you know that's a pretty clear pitch. If theft is no longer possible, then the you know Rob, you talk about this all the time. What is the state's business model? I mean, it's predicated on on theft and then the redistribution of of capital. And so, to the extent that that can be negated or limited, presumably always, you disempower that institution. I always call it making versus taking. Right? There's only two ways to acquire wealth in the world. You can either make it, trade it or you can take it from someone. And so when you increase the cost, risk, expense associated with taking, you're creating an incentive structure that skews everyone towards making. And frankly, the state is in the business of kill, steal, and destroy. That's what it does. So the steal part gets much more expensive, which means the revenue of the state comes down. The kill and destroy could become less, less of an incentive to uh, those ends. But, you know, when you talk about that no theft zone, like how many people will be in there because that determines a lot of this. Um, a skeptic would say, uh, you know, people are just too dumb. They're just not responsible enough, never going to change, never going to happen. But I think a more rationalist way to look at it is the number of people moving or migrating into this no theft zone is driven by the pain they are experiencing. Right. The more you inflate the currency, the more you debase the currency, the more you tax them, the more you oppress them, regulate them. You're creating like an osmotic pressure through the membrane. Mm -hmm. It's like you need mm -hmm. to leave whatever the regime or the fiat complex or whatever system is preying upon you. And you're pushed into into an untouchable asset like Bitcoin by necessity. It's not it's not like, oh, people just get to flip a coin and decide if they're going to be um, irresponsible you know, follower or try to like become a sovereign individual one day. It's like, no, you're, yeah. it's Darwinian, right? There's this like the monsters at your back. And if you're not responding to it, you're being taken out anyways. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I see this playing. I was like, there's a pressure that pushes people into Bitcoin. The more the state misbehaves basically. Which is why it kind of necessitates that tumultuous or, you know, time because people mm -hmm. won't feel that pressure or pain unless things get bad enough for them to do so. Mm -hmm. Did you did you guys see the uh, the the guy who held the hostages in the bank in Lebanon? Uh, mm -hmm. get, I mean, there were people there were people outside, right, cheering on the hostage. <clears throat> that tells you about what's going on in Lebanon, right? Mm -hmm. And there isn't anything really preventing that kind of thing from happening everywhere. He had like two hundred k in the bank, right? I think he had two hundred k, two hundred thirty k or something. He yeah. got away with thirty. He he robbed the bank for his own money. 
He had but to rob was, the bank to get his own. He was money. apprehended. Well, well they after, they right? only yeah. gave him thirty so, after all of the threats and everything. Like I think I, that's what really drove him right. over the edge was that like they would only give him ten, and then like after all these threats, like, well, how about thirty? And he was like, how about I go get my fucking gun and a can of gasoline, and I come back, motherfuckers. <laughs> so he did. That guy was just he, he got he got pushed to his breaking point, and clearly there were a lot of people in Lebanon who were too scared to do the same thing, but who vehemently supported him and his actions, you know, because they're all experiencing it. I mean, but isn't isn't that the truth for all of us? Like, isn't that why we're in this whole mess is we're too fucking scared? Like, all of us collectively as a humanity. Like, we won't stand up and say, these motherfucking thieving, murdering, child raping pieces of shit fucking steal from us. They steal from us and they call it legal and we allow them to do it. And it's so fucking absurd. And now the thing that I love is that I can say, fuck you. I have a magic spell where if I have 12 magic words, you can never guess. No matter how powerful your computation is, no matter how much energy you put into it, you can't have my 12 words and you can't have my money. So go fuck yourselves. I don't know. I'm just excited because like, fuck these people. Fuck the old people who steal from us. Fuck this government who steals from me. Fuck these people that make military and missile things and say we have to go participate in these foreign forays that lose and kill tens of thousands of people. It's fucking absurd. See, sorry I, guys. I, I just like to. I like to. No, we. It's always good to have a few good uh, Eric rants in the huddle hang uh, to be Thank clipped you. and shared yeah. later. But you know, of course, I agree. But I, I think, I mean, as we, as I alluded to a minute ago, like. It's almost like, because we all have that capacity, right? To be that person, either, you know, most, because most of these people are blind to the impacts of their actions, their self-serving behavior, their biases, their greed, playing to their incentives. You know, they, they don't see the connection between, you know, being a cantillionaire and the bombing of, you know, the brown people that you refer to all the time, Eric. Like, that's not a direct line for them, and they would probably refute it to the grave. But you see how the system connects those dots. And, you know, so like we all it's almost like the state and all this bad stuff is like a type of animus. Like we all have it within ourselves. It just seems like the system has almost like has has steered people in a certain direction and then calcified that aspect of themselves such that they have a very difficult time of seeing outside of it or extracting themselves from it. You know, so it's like I share the frustration and the anger, you know, in in the direction of the people that are doing that stuff. But I also recognize that, you know, it's, it's not like we're not, too. We're, you, well, yeah, 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 pretty much. Like we, we all have that capacity. That's why, you know, this revolution is a personal one. It's a spiritual one. It's not mm -hmm. a monetary one. Yeah. I mean, and that's always the case because all we have is our behavior, how we choose to respond in every situation that's all there is that's all there ever will be maybe until ai just takes over and then it's a whole nother kettle of fish but you know so yeah and and i i see less and less i mean i think we we could easily make things worse for ourselves mm -hmm. if we just always continue to divide it along those lines and say bad people there we're the good people we must win over them because you know history is, mm -hmm. is littered with those sorts of um, those sorts of circumstances. And, you know, I, I even, you know, I've spoken with a couple of politicians lately and, you know, someone who's decided to be a politician, it's difficult to get them to, uh, you know, renounce that method of resolving things, let's say, but most of them feel like the problem is the bad guys are in power and I'm the good guy and problems would be resolved if I, you know, if the good guy was in power and I would do all the virtuous things that, that good guys do. Mm. And, you know, they, they all fail to realize that it's the system itself and that it's those assumptions themselves that, that you would presume to determine for other people what's best for them, what's valuable for them, what they want, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's actually the evil. And so um, I don't know how useful it is to, is to, to get angry at, you know, the, the current subset of people that are, have fallen prey to that, you know, psycho spiritual systemic sort of trap rather than you know i think the only thing we have here is our all each of our own personal refinement and then engaging in other people that are engaged in the same thing that are seeing things in a similar way that share so, similar values 
Yeah, go, going forward, I I think um, you know Balaji was on Tim Ferriss and he was talking about. He said that Bitcoin maximalism is the most important ideology that most people are, haven't heard of, and that the next ten years of American life look like wokes versus Bitcoin maximalist. And Bitcoin maximalist will be a very diverse, uh, you know, and you know, uh, socioeconomically diverse as well as gender and race uh, racially diverse class of individuals who all want to take personal sovereignty versus people who are woke, who want to capture authoritarian structures and, and use them to enforce uh, their idea of how the world should be onto everybody else. And you can see these two things like branch out from Occupy Wall Street, like everybody comes together at Occupy, you see where the problem is and what needs to be done about it. And then they branch and it becomes, you know, crypto anarchy, if you want to call it that. And then it becomes uh, woke uh, identitarian politics. Right. And like, John, when you and Robert were on with Jordan Peterson, I read through all the comments and that was a phenomenal episode, by the way, I read through all the comments and a lot of the comments were saying this thing that I totally agreed with, uh, not just because you guys are my friends, but because I think you're both smart and you're both right. And you did a good job orange killing Peterson in that episode. And the comments were saying, basically, these guys sound exactly like the, you know, AOC socialist types except for they have well thought out pragmatic solutions to the problems. And I was like, yeah, that is very similar because both people were aligned at Occupy. We both branched out and there's going to be this moment where things clash again. Like when the millennial generation has power right now, people just have sort of like social media, Twitter power. When people have real power, the clash will happen. And I think that happens over the next 10 years. And we're going to see like how that plays out. And obviously I think the other worldview is kind of insane, right? <laughs> but you know, it's anyone's guess how it how it plays. I think this is part of the reason why, you know, like Bitcoin culture, quote unquote, and you know, maximalism and that kind of stuff seems to me to be like the initial stages, the emergence of I don't know if mythology is the right word, Rob, you can probably correct me on this, but like a a way to conceptualize and understand and see by and even embody what this thing is like th th that's what all these conversations are and that's what all these arguments are and that's what so that like so that's an it's an apprehendable thing so that when these st standoffs occur or when people are deciding for themselves like you know, what kind of perspective should I construct? What, what do I feel about this and that? What should be my highest values? Like how and, and how they orient me and all that kind of stuff. Like, I think the what's happening is like that, whatever, Bitcoin is fostering something that provides an answer to that question more easily and more easily as, as days go by. And like, maybe it will be a type of mythology attached to that or maybe a secular type of mythology, but like it needs to be apprehendable, right? Like people need something to grasp onto to orient their perspective. And I guess part of my hope is that, you know, the more people that come in and the more people that digest it for themselves and express it and communicate what it means or the, the angle that they, they have a particular degree of clarity on will like feed that, that process so that, so that people will make, I don't know. So people have more, options or, or, or a broader perspective when they come to that fork in the road that you were just kind of alluding to where it's like where they think it's a us against them or they think it's a separation i think you know bitcoin is a, has the capacity to be a unifier in that way as has you know former myths and and heroes and stuff serve that purpose right you know the redeemer the unifier that kind of thing like i think this is why we're we're naturally drawn to these analogies with bitcoin and and you know, myth and religion and theology and stuff is because it seems to be emerging, you know, and it's still so fucking early. I mean, we're 13 mm -hmm. years into this. It's crazy early. And look how much has happened with it already. And look how much meaning has been ascribed to it. And look how it's being unpacked and flourishing in the world. Um, so, I mean, that gave me a tremendous amount of hope because like, obviously there's a ton of polarization out there today. And, you know, despite the fact that some loud idiots on Twitter, uh, you know, decry the maximalists as being, you know, just horrible people. Uh, I think this, 
albeit sometimes messy process is playing out that it's it's providing people like something else to graft onto that's not so polarizing as you know as as weird as that may sound because like some people can often think that the whole you know that maximalism maximalism is very polarizing but as you said Hala, like those comments in the youtube video i, I haven't seen many of them but it kind of makes sense that people are looking for something that synthesizes all these perspectives into something that's productive of a meaningful and a happy life and not just you know getting you frustrated and amped up by being on one side and hoping that your side wins well that oh synthesis is the key word you had there and to me like because of what the internet and how it's function like i very sincerely believe that that bitcoin has synthesized some of the deepest principles of fascism and some of the deepest principles of communism and smash them because like the leadership of Satoshi and the choice of 21 million units, that was a unilateral decision by Satoshi that no one can change. Like that is a purely fascist notion. But in the same way that all addresses, all UTXOs are homogenous and there is no way to differentiate between them or the value of them. Like that's a very extreme communist position. But when you smash these two things together and recreate it, it's a Heidelian synthesis of a thesis and an antithesis and the way that they recombine to create something totally new, you know? And so it makes sense to me that when we talk, we can have, we can say a lot of things that are going to appeal to AOC types and, and Bernie Sanders supporters, and also to people that find themselves deeply on the conservative side and might support Trump for the ways that, that they felt that he resisted kind of the liberal global agenda. So I, mm. I think what's going on, and again, this is why this is all extremely political, because it breaks out of the classic politics framework that we're so familiar with and delivers us something truly political, because it's not about the, the oscillation of party politics anymore, but it's about radically changing the structure of our world to serve us in a better manner, which is truly the most political thing that exists. I think it's important to note that when I agree with you, by the way, but I think it's important to note that, uh, you know, current politics uh, are here and Bitcoin exists here, here at a level mm -hmm. above. It's it's metapolitical. Yeah, and that's Absolutely. that goes like when, John, you're saying that we're all struggling to apprehend this thing and, uh, you know, it's it's rapidly causing us to adapt ourselves in different ways. I love you know, this, the, the idea of trying to understand the absolute from a position of the relative. And now this is like, give me a minute to unpack this, but I think this is a deeper point that I've come to is it's almost like God, right? You have all these books and wisdom traditions and words pointing to this higher ineffable reality. Um, that's, that's words. We're using relative words to try to point to something that's absolute. You could think of the absolute as like a higher dimension. So the sphere does not exclude the circle, right? The circle is just 2D space. Something's relative. The sphere doesn't exclude it. It transcends it, but simultaneously includes it, right? This is like getting into the platonic realm of forms, right? Where you can see this glass, but once you know it's a glass, you've like incorporated it into intelligibility and you can do a million things. So... I think that, you know, Bitcoin obviously is an absolute. It's the only absolute we've ever created, 21 million. So we've, you know, I tried to analogize this to zero a little bit. Like you've, you've almost touched the void in a way. You, get, you touch that invisible reality that you're always trying to describe from the perspective of the relative, but it's actually absolute. So the words never do it justice. So what if Bitcoin is essentially that, like a platonic form of money, which that's basically what we think it is, right? It's the perfect money. Can't be disrupted, can't be copied, can't be replicated, can't be changed. Um, and if it is that, then like Eric was describing this unity of fascism and communism, well, that would make perfect sense because Bitcoin is the fucking philosopher's stone. It's the unity of opposites. It combines these different things. So it, and then if that's true, so it's the platonic form of money or it's the philosopher's stone or it's some other crazy big idea. And there's a mythological echo that emerges behind technological shifts in reality. Like how substantial is this mythological echo going to be? It's going to reverberate through everything like socially, politically, spiritually, financially, philosophically, maybe even religiously that this 
we're living in the beginning of that potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we might be the crazy pioneers into this new thing or people think, Oh, these guys have just joined a cult and drink some weird Kool-Aid. And now they, you know, talk about Bitcoin a lot, or this could actually be one of the most significant technological change in human history, you know, to the point where we would say it all, it was all about this. All right. We've been talking about the philosopher's stone for thousands of years Clearly, like zero had a big impact on how we organize ourselves, leading to printing press, enlightenment, all of these things, calculus. So what if this is like, the, it's just the, the fruit of all of that. Bitcoin has been like the point. It's been the point, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, and I mean, like when we look at that in the chain of historicism, like the development of crypto and how it needed to have this highly advanced, powerful state to commit all of this research and development. And finally, now that we're, what I find so interesting is about the way that cryptography is functioning today. Like I, I see it as this level that uh, like we're at the last God because like the promise of cryptography to never be broken, like it is a deliverable and possible promise. And, and Rob, I would even say that, that this, this is really a platonic language. Like it, it, it's a, a language of such extreme precision that like we're no longer describing things, but we're actually saying the immediacy of the proof or the truth that we state. And that creates uh -huh. a totally different semantic field where we're not trying to just understand the words, but we know the immediacy of the proof of the word, which, which transforms right. language itself entirely. So it makes it so high resolution that we're no longer trying to describe yeah. shit to each other, but we're just making statements. That's a great point. So yeah, there's a symbol and there's the referent, right? But Bitcoin brings them together, like the map and the territory. I, I think GG's the sign and the signified. The, yeah, the sign and the signified. By the way, and I, that, I, I, mean, I don't think it can in be. In that gap oh, where all the bullshit occurs, right? In fiat world, it's where there's a promise over here and the thing undelivered here, all the games that are played in between, like that's the problem. That's the Which lie we me today. Which brings me full circle back to my original thesis at Crypto Sovereignty. It, it, it's authority, not truth, creates legitimacy in fiat world. Truth, not authority, creates legitimacy in the real world. What were you going to say, Hoddle? I was just going to say, like, I, I don't think it can be overstated um, how important the concept of absolute scarcity is. And I think Rob's piece, number zero, like, does a really good job trying to get to the heart of it. But even still, that piece, like, barely scratches the surface, right? Because it's just such a foreign concept to have something that's widely distributed, but absolutely scarce. It, it's so foreign, it literally doesn't exist in nature. We don't know about anything else that is that. That's how alien this substrate is. And so, yeah, no, no, no wonder we lose our fucking minds trying to figure it out every goddamn time. <laughs> it takes me back to that Go quote on. that the greatest shortcoming of humanity is the inability to understand the exponential function. So it's not only is it absolute, but it's issue and schedule is on exponential decay. And that's mm -hmm. why I just don't think we can get our head around how fast and powerful it well, could happen. That's also why I think the, the primary focus of everyone here should be on themselves, right? Like digesting this, how you're, you're engaging with this new notion, this new technology and how it's transforming you. Because like, it's so as you've just said, it's so foreign and its impact is going to be so profound and the exponential effects are going to be so profound. I mean, you can't suppose to Im impose or graft onto anybody else, like what an understanding of this should be or the effect it should have. Cause you know, mm -hmm. you should be almost fully engulfed by your own attempt to integrate it and understand it, you know? And so I think that just goes back to the fact that this is an individual revolution and the transformations are individual and we can certainly mix it up with one another as we do, because we're all just here being like, yo, like, what about this? Like, did you consider this? Did you consider this? And did this work for you? But ultimately, like, that's, that's the rub here is that an, an, like another step in the evolution or transformation of the individual is, is underway. And Rob, to your point about, uh, you know, like all of history has kind of been, you know, coming to this crescendo as it were, or like this next big step up, you know, you, you could, you could say that, the characteristics of property up till now have been not only the, 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 the defining characteristic, but possibly even the, the primary motive for civilization itself. I mean, the earliest known records we have are property transactions, right? Like goats for 
figs and all that kind of stuff in Sumeria and those tablets. And because once property enters the picture, well, now you have relative value and now you have something to protect and now you need someone to help you protect it. And like, and civilization bloom from there once once basically we had agricultural surplus and then we had division of labor and then we had more complex property boom civilizations off off to the races and the fact that property as you said earlier rob you never had like a pristine relationship to your property it was always conditional in some way or it always you know you required trust in order to uh, preserve it in some capacity and to exchange it and all that a civil a civilization was born around that fact, around those that those attributes of property. And now, if we're suggesting that a form of property has entered the picture that is so you know different from any previous form of property, such that it doesn't require any of those things that literally became predicates for civilization, well, what kind of civilization, what kind of impact uh, on civilization does that have? And that's what we're we're trying to figure out, right? And that's what we're 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 wrapped up in. Like that's the very process that we're wrapped up in. And and you know, the final thing I wanted to say regarding your point about uh, mythology and uh, you know, Eliade's work is basically like we whatever technological era we're primarily in, we don't. Need, it's not like it's conscious. It seems like an aspect of our consciousness and how we relate to the world is that we it it bubbles up within us to allow us to engage the technological socioeconomic landscape that the that we're in right so initially it was hunter gatherer and the mythology was about hunting and all the different things that influence hunting and then it became agricultural and the mythology was about fertility and plants and vegetal you know mythology and then when we when the metals you know came into the scene then a lot of the mythology was you know, alchemical and had to do with metallurgy and, you know, that kind of stuff. Now, and you, you could make the case that um, maybe we're in an era now where information is the, the new frontier. And so what kind of mythology are we in the process of subconsciously contributing to or developing right now? And how much does, does Bitcoin do that? It's like each of these successive technological innovations broadens the the landscape or the environment that we have to contend with and we need to graft a quote-unquote mythology a narrative way of understanding that landscape in order to most fruitfully engage it and if if you know i i think the agricultural revolution and the the metals revolution and the industrial revolution they were like they were big step ups in terms of the the environment that we have to contend with the landscape of meaning let's say but the information revolution where we where we can actually create digital realms ad infinitum presumably is the biggest expansion of our consciousness that we've ever had. And we are going to need narrative to engage that landscape optimally. And there's a there's a pretty big aversion in the modern secular world to the notion that mythology is quote unquote real or narrative is real and necessary in some way. But I don't see why it would play out any differently that this stage in our technological evolution will necessitate and foster a narrative means to engage it most optimally, whatever form that may take. I mean, we're probably in the middle of it right now, so it's very difficult to step outside of it and see it. But why would it happen any any differently? I mean, to me, this is part of why I see the Messiah narrative so perfect. Like. Like it overlays with Satoshi and what he did and how it was created and what it gives to people so perfectly, in my opinion, toward the the sort of biblical story. In addition to, I get that like it feels cringy and people don't like talking about it, but like when we make the comparatives of what was given by both and the possibility of what that accesses humanity to, like it seems to fucking line, <laughs> you know, and like. Like, what's really important to me is, like, my whole insane philosophical journey hasn't been, like, like confirm what I believe, con confirm. No, it's been, like, I don't fucking know. But the more I read and the deeper I go, the more it aligns. And, like, you know, like, this Heidegger shit's the hardest shit I've ever read. And it's so complicated and convoluted. But, god damn, so many times the stuff aligns so immediately and profoundly. And the fact that he's talking about a phenomenological event that he can describe that aligns so deeply to what, what Bitcoin is, 
like I, I'll share some of this stuff with you guys later, but he talks about stuff about like how sovereign knowledge is like the single thing that once we like totally grasp it and allow for that to come into service for us, that that like transforms all of humanity in this really radical way, which seems to be exactly what's going on, you know? And, and to me, this is so radical and revolutionary because it, it's humanity coming back into contact with the truth of what ratio is and why we need that as people and what that delivers us to, you know? And it, yeah. And it calls us to a higher duty as well, because like now, now we realize that like nihilistic fiat world where nothing matters isn't real. And that, that that's actually the falsest thing. You, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll be like debating with people, discussing ideas with people or whatever. And, and people go, that's really interesting. Uh, wh- where'd you get the article for that? And it's like, uh, it's just <laughs> from my brain, my dude, I don't read articles. <laughs> I just read the headlines. I assume the article says some gibberish inside of it. Like, we're not doing articles, man. I don't need an article. It's just another person thinking for you. You know what I mean? I trust myself to to think for myself and you know view reality the way I see fit. That's a hard a concept per- for a lot of people. Like really hard. Sure. It is. It is. You know, and, and to, I've been reading a shit ton lately. And to your point, Eric, like Bitcoin just it's you have this lens you have this thing in bitcoin and all the things you've been thinking about it and then you you read this stuff and if you either accept or can uh, see past the the historicity arguments of whatever the myth or religion or philosophy might be putting forward like it's so it jumps off the page you're like oh this is this is like this is exactly what they're talking about like bitcoin is just lines up perfectly with this you know and so and i think to your, almost to your, your point, Hoddle, like it speaks to, you know, we're, we're always just kind of thinking, we're trying to figure out like, you know, what does all this mean? I mean, some of us, other people just don't give a fuck and they go about their, their day and, you know, they're not, they're not trying to push the bounds of understanding or clarity or perspective or whatever, but many people do. And if you run that program long enough, and especially like if you, you bump it up against like, and this is the other thing that I, I, I'm super critical of, you know, today, on the secular crowd, it's like they so easily dismiss like so many amazing theological and religious thinkers of the past. And like, they may be, they may not be perfectly right. You know, one of the big things that like the Christian faith kind of hangs their hat on is the historicity of Jesus. Right. And like I, my current perspective on that is that the myth is hyper real and it's almost like the historicity of the man. And this is like blasphemous to the extreme, but like doesn't, matter as much as the reality of of the myth um lost my train of thought well i i could jump in and say i agree with you utterly and totally on the importance of the hyper real you know this is this is numbers right are numbers real or hyper real right clearly they're very fucking important without Mm -hmm. calculus we have nothing there's no technology basically at all no advanced technology. So again, it's that, that uh, I think they also call this the nom- nomological that plane where we actually name stuff, the domain of logic and rationality versus empiricism, right? Observation and experience. So the way those two interact is key to everything in our entire existence. Um, I, think, I don't know if you've yeah. trained to talk. No, I, yeah, I found I, it came back, but like that's kind of the point. You run, you're running that program, and and you come up against these, these like hyper real notions, and maybe you don't have like a great frame of reference for them in in the past, right? But Bitcoin seems to be that things that that thing that helps lock them into place, you know, by being almost, you know, we touched on this before, but almost being a, like a real manifestation of a lot of those hyper real notions or or philosophies or truths. Mm-hmm. Um, and the comment about, you know, modern secular people dismissing all that was just like, I think there's profound, profound truth in them. And as we continue to, you know, go down this rabbit hole and try to properly contextualize Bitcoin, it, it pulls out the hyper real from all of these stories. Like Rob, we're both reading the history of uh, religious ideas right now. And that's basically what Eliade and Neumann and Peterson and Jung and these guys have done. Like they've, they've looked for the hyper real in all the world's, you know, different traditions and philosophies. And they tried to tease them out. And I guess the case of, 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or a Huxley, another one, the perennial yeah. philosophy. So it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and it, I think the reason why we're like so enthusiastic here is because we're pursuing that. We're seeing what these guys have said about pulling out the hyper real from the, uh, from the mythological or from the narrative. And we're seeing it represented in its highest form, but also in the tangible interpersonal form in their world in the form of Bitcoin. And like, this is the back and forth between like, I think this is why we go to the Heidegger's and the Eliades and the Petersons or whatever, because we're trying to see like, because they may very well have figured out a lot of stuff about the hyper real in the past that now can be graphed onto Bitcoin, that it can help us properly contextualize or understand what Bitcoin is. And I think all of us are realizing or think we're realizing, we could be completely fucking delusional, but think we're realizing that like, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. There's there's a lot of like hyperlinking going on from the hyper real insights of the past to this current quote unquote technological phenomenon. And it, you know, again, like how could that not be mind blowing? Cause it's like, it's there, it's there in the flesh. You've, you've seen that map, right? Where it's a, a brain on, on psilocybin and the connections are cleaner versus the brain without psilocybin, the ca- connections are, uh, the connections are chaotic. To me, I, I think about that often as fiat versus Bitcoin, right? you know, fiat, every dollar that's bouncing around the global economy is creating these distortions, right? And it makes it very difficult to see what's actually going on. Things are murky. And as Bitcoin bounces around the global economy, it's pure signal. So it sort of forms this like sacred geometrical pattern where you get this like clear ordered hierarchy where things make sense. And once you have that, you have an organizing principle with which to make sense of the world, right? hundred percent. That's, that's it. I would and, just and like, so, sorry, just to throw in one thing yeah. here. People make fun of Sailor about digital energy, but I think it's exactly this. He's talking about connecting the digital domain, right? The name of the knowing and math and logic is now being rooted into physical reality. So I think maybe that term gets misconstrued in a lot of different ways, but we're saying kind of the same thing, right? We've There's now a permanent connection between the ideological space and thermodynamic space something like yeah. that yeah yeah like it's, the, a new, it's a new <laughs> it's crazy it's, yeah it's like they're, a rift in space time between uh physical reality and digital reality the, the hyper real well, and yeah the quote-unquote yeah. real the material well it links the, the 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 temporal spatial and the energy realm together in such a way you know and and what's so fucking weird is that, like, Pottle, you were saying earlier that we have a world that has, has no limits on anything. And I'd say, like, the only exception is subjective time. We all have mm-hmm. limited yeah. time and we're all going to die. And so, like, with Bitcoin being a clock that's keeping track of time and then linking that to energy, you know, this is one of the other funny ones that I've wanted to work on. Is I actually think at the very bottom, there's a really interesting uh, Marxist analysis of Bitcoin to be made through the labor theory of value vis-a-vis energy because like that's all it is it's just like taking energy and then making them into these units that can be distributed and so like it it, it's also very strange and fascinating because like i the 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 proof of work component i can't i have such a hard time satoshi foreseeing it going out this far and changing things this radically and this, again, brings me back to, like, why I think this was a divine revelation, because there's just, like, mm-hmm. there's too many things in this that are perfect. Like, the 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 SEP 256 curve that was utilized, like, had all of these really interesting, discrete methods to be able to utilize cryptography that were just unknown before. It's just, yeah. it, it's really crazy that, like, it's just like, oh, because, like, he, he chose this specific curve, we can now create these new cryptographic algorithms that like we didn't have any idea existed before it's fucking crazy talk about mythology too i mean how crazy is it that we still don't fucking know who satoshi is and we probably never will that's dude in this day and age with the pervasive surveillance state there's an invisible fence everywhere you go i walk down the street there's nine uh, fucking doorbell cameras that pick me up come on man satoshi is the well, hide and seek champion of the world it's amazing <laughs> Well, and the fact that he did that in this gap between, you know, 2004, where we had all of the technology that went into Bitcoin and today we're like doing this is totally impossible. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, 
again and again, I'm just always really overwhelmed at like the timing was perfect, the way he presented it was perfect, the way he had ran his, you know, forward secrecy was perfect. And it's uh yeah, it's so reassuring in so many ways, you know. And yeah. uh but you can you yeah, can it, easily see how how mythology develops, right? And how you could easily project out how mythology would develop around Satoshi, even though like, you know, is, is Satoshi the, the kind of the character that received revelation and, uh, you know, Bitcoin itself is the, the instantiation of the word, the logos, you know, the Messiah, the Christ character, like, you know, I'm sure that'll be played out many times, but you, like, it's going to be mythologized. And you're going to, you're going to look at Satoshi's sacrifice, you know, what, what, look at what he gave up in order to gift this to the world. You're also going to investigate his, his ethics. I mean, how, he obviously had certain ethics that he held and that Bitcoin wouldn't have been right. It wouldn't have been finished if it could not carry out these ethics. And we discuss them all the time, right? The ethic of inviolability, of truth, of in, the incapacity for lying, the, you know, of, and how that grants freedom. Like all those things, whether he was conscious of them or not, had to come through him in his intent when he was formulating this thing. And I mean, of course, myths are going to emerge around that. You know, I, I often think about, I've been studying, uh, you know, the Bible and Christ and all that stuff a lot lately. And I, I think it's, Rob, you might be able to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I think like, well, first of all, the first image of Christ, uh, and it's somewhat spurious, but let's just say the first image of Christ was 200 years after his supposed life, you know, and, and the recording of like the, the, the Bible in written form was long after his his death as well you know and so like mm -hmm. there's so much room for uh these things to take shape in the culture in response to what people think of this person and and, and how they felt and you know we're gonna i don't know I, I think the point is like we're gonna it's so ripe for mythologizing because it's so mysterious but it's also so powerful in what he did both in what he gave to us his sacrifice what he imbued in his creation that of course, given the course of time, we're going to mythologize about it. We already do in many cases when we all this art and, you know, story about Satoshi. And it's only been 13 years. Why don't you put 100 years on that and see how people think about how special it was that this person emerged at this time and get and gifted this thing to the world in the way he gifted it and what that means and, and how it can serve as an example for other people in relation to how they sacrifice, how they give their compassion, their commitment to certain ideals and values like duh right it's, uh, it's gonna happen it, it's it's mind-blowing and i again just it seems like the mythology could just connect itself to alchemy it's itself right so now all of a sudden satoshi could inherit maybe <laughs> some of that that heritage where this thing this philosopher's stone which i probably you guys have probably heard me say this but like i'll say it again christianity basically thought originally that we had final redemption in the spirit, right? Christ died for our sins and that's it. We're all good. And then a few hundred years go by and people are looking around like, hey, there's still a lot of, like poor people that are suffering and dying. And there's a lot of disease and terrible things in the world. Like, is this it? This is the final redemption. And basically alchemy forked, right? Forked and said, no, we need to go into the material realm and find redemption. And Carl, you know, Peterson says this a lot, but he calls Carl Jung described alchemy as the dream from which science was born. So, mm. which is a way to say like, we have to enact these mythologies. That's kind of the, their, their purpose in a way is they give us a code of behavior. Um, like the example that Peterson commonly uses, is how do you get a research scientist to look down a microscope for 10 hours a day? Right. You can't get an animal to do that. <laughs> there has to be this imagined, but, um, this ideal you're moving towards, right? It's it's it takes place in the imagination. Even things like property, by the way, we were saying earlier, like that's an imaginary thing too, right? We all had to pretend that we can't take each other's shit to actually start not taking each other's shit. So there's this, and if you have kids, like what do they do? They're constantly playing imaginary. So it's it's how we relate to the world. It's our it's one of our primary, I don't know, perceptual structures, I guess. Mm. And so if Bitcoin and again, the Philosopher's Stone was like the apex pursuit of alchemy, the incorruptible substance that would save the world from tyranny. It would unify opposites. Um, and so what, you know, what if Bitcoin is a religion born from computer science? Then 
maybe that is the unifier of science and religion or contributes to it somehow. I mean, I just find it so interesting that like everybody's so like, ooh, ooh, like this being religion, like we should embrace it. Cause I mean, like it's literally fucking magic, like 12 goddamn words that can like <laughs> never ever be created in that same order. And like, all I have to do is, is, is like use a random number generator to do it. Like it, it's, it's fucking wild. And I also think that like, as this mythology builds like the the like looking back at the blockchain as like be like being like this book that like keeps information and you know what people will put into it like the the cultural aspect that's going to play out here is going to be really exciting and cool um and 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 we're already seeing components of it that i'm really enjoying i i think we've already got a lot of pretty cool art and pretty interesting commentary going on so well, there's that, I, I was going to mention this when John was talking about secularism is that uh, I think that tenant that you were just talking about, Eric, of like dismissing theology, mythology, religion, the, the human religious impulse. I think that's a tenant of secularism. Um, like I think secularism needs to discount that in order for secularist religion to flourish. Like, cause if you think about like simulation theory, that's just intelligent design for a secularist, right? Or like white privilege is original sin for secularist, right? Like they have their own religion. It's just their religion uh, demands this conceit in order for their religion to bubble to the surface because they have kind of a weak, pathetic religion for cucks and it can't like stand up to Zeus or God or whatever. You know what I mean? So they have to dismiss. I love how you said that because it is religious ultimately. So every yeah. ism, right? Fascism, communism, statism, they, these are all religions ultimately. They, they're at least religious in nature. And, um, you have to accept that. But again, our culture, you know, we use the word myth to mean false. Like we're so out of touch with that reality that um, we're out of touch with ourselves as a result. Yeah, we don't yeah. see the religious impulse in ourselves and what we attach that to in the world. Well, I, well, like, I, look, I look around at the world today and I see a God shaped hole in everyone's heart, basically. And mm. they fill it. They fill it with, you know, porn and weed and the Joe Rogan experience podcast and Disney and the new Marvel movie and fucking. Uh, Bitcoin and all sorts of shit, right? And like, I guess what I'm saying is like, of all the things that are on the table, at least Bitcoin has a lot of optionality for new space. And we don't yet know what it's going to be. And it's very exciting. Plus, it's the only religion that pays you, you know, all the other ones you have to pay to join. <laughs> well, also, like I look out into the world and like, I, like it would be different if there was like all these really happy people who are like successful that, you know, there was like a, a burgeoning middle class right. and like everybody on their own home. And like people were like pretty, pretty happy and with it. But I look out there and like, it's really far from that, you know? And so like, I don't, I always find it so interesting that secularists are, are like, no, like fuck this idea of like infinite love and, and goodness. Like it's just it's black and dark all the way down. And like, I, I totally get it. Like, I like, that's what it looks like on the surface. I just feel lucky enough that between Bitcoin and psychedelics, like I, I've seen what I believe to be, you know, my higher power and calling and the way that it summons me. And at the end of the day, like, again, like I'm, I'm a truth maximalist. I'm really curious because like yeah. what I see about Bitcoin is that it offers all of these things. And if I'm wrong, like, please tell me what my 12 words are. Like, I, I want to know if I'm wrong and if you can, like, guess them and if you can, like, corrupt it or fuck it up. Because, like, that's what it's about for me. And, like, again, not to bring it back to shit coining, but I see all these shit coins who claim the same thing. And then when the rubber hits the road, it turns out that, like, they're not decentralized or sovereign or any of this other shit. And for me, that's part of the, the contentual model that I have with everything else is that Bitcoin is so fundamentally different from all the other shit going on. And that's really important for me to emphasize because there was no other first cryptocurrency. There is no other Satoshi Nakamoto. There is no other currency that guarantees and limits utilizing proof of work and the sunk cost that goes into that as Bitcoin. There just aren't, they don't exist. And those are all very, very, very fucking important things that if you can't speak to deeply and at length on each one of those points you don't fucking understand anything that's going on here and frankly i believe you're a huckster that's trying to sell me some fucking garbage that you can that that you can offload onto me so you can make fiat money that like yeah. that's what my truth is yeah i, I want to comment on rob what you said about 
your daughter and then like this theme that we've been working on about like the the current maybe secular era that we're in and and the god-shaped hole in people's hearts but like as you say about your daughter she's always imagining things she's playing out these narratives in her mind and what she's trying to do is see how much the narrative matches her reality right oh this this narrative allows me to engage this well oh it 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 failed me here i need to adjust the narrative a little bit oh it failed me here it failed me in this circumstance right and she's constantly just narrativizing all the the space that she's engaged in her environment to try to figure out the best fit right and what the fuck do you think religion is it's the enterprise it's it's doing that on the maximal possible way it's saying okay we're all here trying to figure out the best fit what is the best fit now that says two things it says something about ourselves but it also says something about the hyper real right and so it's almost like we're drawing we're, we're always trying to push the map that we generate closer on to the territory, both the material and observable and the immaterial and inobservable that consciousness is contending with, right? And so we're to maximal fit. And I think the, the really interesting part about that that relates to what we were saying before is Eliade's point about the agricultural and the metal and the different technological revolutions is that those engagements with the material and the innovations that come from them and then spread dramatically change the environment that we're contending with. So we have the agricultural revolution that emerges a new landscape from the hunter gatherer. And so this map that we're constantly using to try to engage in that has to dramatically change because now the, the territory has dramatically changed. Then when the metallurgical revolution happened, the map has to change because the territory dramatically changed. And so the map is the myth, the map is the religion, right? And so now we have this dramatic expansion of the territory once again. And so we need a new way to fit to it. And I think we may be in a period where that technological change, call it the industrial slash digital revolution, which has been happening for like the last 200 years, you have that schism in the early parts of that, that transformation where an old map was, was being used, but a new territory emerged. And so you've got people hanging on to the old map and you've got people that have done away with the old map to engage in the new territory, but haven't properly formulated a new map for the new territory yet. And it seems plausible to me that we're in the era or in the process of, be, of recognizing that we're in a dramatically new territory once again, seems to happen. Well, maybe it's happening more quickly now, but you know, again, the hunter-gatherer, the agricultural, the metallurgical, uh, you know, the printing press, maybe we might say, or the industrial, and now, now the digital. And we're in that period where people have not let go of the old map or they have, and they don't have a new one. And so there's, there's all this wandering. It's like, well, how am I supposed to engage in this space? What are the system of values that allow me to do so optimally? What should I be pursuing? What, how do I determine value in this new territory? And I don't think maybe we've developed the proper internal map for that yet which is why we might be manifesting a lot of the things we might be critical of in this global culture, broadly speaking, because we have this new technology and we're contending with a new technological environment and all the possibility that is represented in that, but we don't know how to engage it. And so maybe part right. of the way we're engaging it is building nuclear weapons and focusing on things that ultimately are of very little meaning, but it's because we're kind of flying blind in a new territory. And Bitcoin seems to be at least part of the impetus or something that's allowing us or nudging us or, or like forcing us to generate a new map for this new territory. Yeah, no. It, so we, as you keep 13 years in, right, extremely early, basically like the blink of an eye into something that could be forever for the rest of human history. Um, and this is just we're, we're in, we've been impacted this much. The world's been impacted this much by just the emergence of Bitcoin. But there's another effect that occurs here potentially, which is the rug pulling of the nation state, right? The collapse of the old map or the old imaginal structure. And then people are going to be this, the 40 years in the desert. People will just be lost. They won't have this cultural stability or a stable stability of relationship, let's say, to the world. And then you're forced into this. What we're going through now, I would say we're reestablishing our philosophical anchor points. That's what the Bitcoin rabbit hole is. It's like, Hey, everything you thought was real, well, it's all bullshit. <laughs> um, good luck. Figure it out. 
And so that, so you're almost thrown back into being a three or four year old asking why, right? We're asking why, asking why. And that's why we're all philosophizing and reading Heidegger and all this other crazy shit. And just to like, again, for the skeptics out there, because when I first started learning about mythology and narrative, I mean, I'm a, I have a, like a finance accounting background. I'm much more of a physics, science, math guy. I thought it was all horse shit. But just as one, one example that really landed with me, these imaginal wor- worlds that we create, this to call it the world of theory, it shapes how we interpret reality. So for instance, the sun has been rising and setting for as long as humans have been on the earth. For a really fucking long time, we thought that sun was spinning around us, right? Going around and around the earth. And then finally along comes Copernicus and says, hey guys, actually there's a perspectival shift you have to make here it's the sun that's in the center and we're going around the sun so he introduced a new theory that causes you to reinterpret all the data right we'd seen sunsets and sunrises forever everyone knew about them it was open source if you will there was nothing hidden about it but due to a bad theory we had the opposite interpretation of reality so it's these theoretical structures can really shape how you see the world well, and, and when Copernicus showed up and he was like, hey, check out this new theory, they weren't like, oh, like, great, like, thank you, like, let's integrate right. him. And they're like, they're like fucking like burn his ass <laughs> yes. to death. Yes. And anybody else, like, fucking burn them too. Yes. Well, and what I think is really cool is also, like, uh, you know, Sanity like, like is Thomas Hobbes. Ho- culture. Yeah. Well, and like, what's really cool is that, like, uh, like Thomas Hobbes, for example, he, like, hung out with, like, fucking copernicus i think or maybe it was galileo but like these people who like were all like the baddies at that point in time who were like on the edge of all this stuff you know like alchemy was totally forbidden by the the church to practice it and what i think is cool is that like all these guys were actually like kind of seeing the same thing and getting along with each other to like create the enlightenment which i think is pretty similar which is what's happening to a lot of us as we've all showed up and been like hey there's like this Bitcoin thing's pretty cool. I, I like really like how like I can't steal from you. You're like, I like that I can't steal from you too. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, hey, like, what else? Do you do you happen to like to like make your own money and think that like people stealing from you suck? You're like, yeah, totally. I'm like, maybe we should like uh, collaborate a little, you know? You don't like Eric's, war either. Eric is <laughs> so right that like when you tie yourself to the masthead of truth, uh, usually they kill you. <laughs> right like george george carlin has this thing where he's like if you're gonna tell people the truth you better make them laugh because otherwise they'll fucking kill you that's brilliant. and then like that's 200 years later they go hey man you remember that guy we killed and then people are like yeah and it's like he has some good ideas now that i'm thinking about it you know? <laughs> well, like, this, this is what i fucking hate with the state all their like like all the martin luther king stamps and malcolm said i'm like do you guys realize they killed they, like, him i know fucking killed him and then like <laughs> You guys are like, hey, like, you know, maybe black people should get like the same opportunities as other people. Yeah, like, it's like, well, why did you guys kill him in the first place? But like, well, hey, hang on, that was, that wasn't really us. That was, you know, well, let's not talk about this anymore. It's not, it doesn't make <laughs> us feel good. But this, you know, this is why, I think I mentioned this on one of these before. But this is why all of these sorts of things are religious, like what's going to, what may happen to Bitcoin or people that are against the Bitcoin, against Bitcoin, like these are religious persecutions in the very way we just described. If we're saying that the lens through which we generate our perspective or that map, that, that narrative map that helps us engage reality. I mean, that's a fundamental component of our worldview, right? How we see the world is how we think we decide, determine our behavior, et cetera. Um, if that, is is like if and so that's religious right that's kind of the idea of a religious story if you're saying that hey like i'm operating on a different map now from you like your map is shitty and it's creating all these fucking problems and suffering and all that garbage and i'm done with it and i'm i'm using a different map now and i'm seeing things differently and i'm interacting differently and all that kind of stuff well then i mean again like that's a religious divide and the persecution against you from the people who use the, the, the group who use the dominant map, let's say, or the map that's most widely used, they're going to have a problem with that because you're attacking the very means by which they understand and engage themselves in the world. 
you know, and th this is the, the kind of the, the idea of like the reintroduction of chaos. Like you, you have all these frameworks that allow you to make sense of the infinitude of information and potentiality in the world and distill it down into your perspective that allows you to seek and meet your own ends. And when much of that becomes disintegrated or dissolved, it's incredibly like uh, ter it's terrifying. Right. And, and the, the, the expected, we, sh we shouldn't be surprised that part of the response is like, uh, to attack the thing that's that's generating that, right? That's making you feel that way. Also, and think, I think about. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, like, I think a lot of us in, in in Bitcoin land, like, we've all gone through that to some degree. Like, I know a lot of us yeah. were kind of uh, counter, you know, cultural or or skeptical beforehand. But like, you still have to go through that process of and having the the, the courage. Like, that, that's why courage is such an important component. And this is kind of the analogy to psychedelics as well. Like when you have that ego death moment in a, in a, in a like a hardcore psychedelic experience, the impulse is to be, just freak the fuck out because who, who are you without all those different things that you attach to yourself to, to be a person in the world. And if you, you need at least to some degree, in my opinion, an element of courage to say like, I don't know who I am anymore in this moment but I, I have like a, a seed of truth that I'm hanging on to, whether it's like, you know, that your fundamental energy or spirit, or whether it's, you know, this thing in Bitcoin that I'm using and I'm reconstructing things from there. I'm going to reconstruct my conception of myself. I'm going to reconstruct my worldview, my perception with that grain that I think is a, a higher truth than what was generating my perspective before. And that takes courage and that takes dedication and commitment. And this is the, alchemical process, right? This is the transformation that we often allude to. And Bitcoiners are, seem to me to be very well on that journey. And what it's generating is we would assert a, a perspective that's more grounded in truth and also probably, you know, in values that are more uh, validly, hierarchically um, arranged. But to anyone who hasn't done that and who's just still holding on to the previous worldview, and I, and I would say one that's far less consciously derived or constructed, they're going to think you're crazy. You're an enemy. You're a psychopath. You're dangerous. All those things, which is why we often kill our heroes, right? And only look back. And once that new worldview has had a chance to sweep through more people over the course of hundreds of years, oftentimes, then it's like obvious. And you wonder how those people could have been so crazy to like, you know, burn Copernicus at the stake. Like, what, were they retarded or something? It's like, no, they just, they were in a completely different worldview and he was too divergent. You know, he was one of the early ones and he got caught. He what? He didn't make them laugh. Right, yeah. exactly. He should have been like, hey, crazy thing. You guys never going to believe this. <laughs> uh, fucking the sun's at the center of the solar system. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, that, that's why I love uh, JP Sears, Rob, who you had open for you in uh, Miami. Because, yeah, you know, great. he says all great stuff and he points out the craziness and he you know he's clearly operating from a perspective that holds freedom and truth in very high regard but he does it in a way that's comical and so he gets away with you know being the joker as as peterson often alludes to where he, you know he's the only one that can go up to the king and be like yeah oh, you're a crazy fucker and you're destroying the world and like everybody hates you ha, ha, ha. because you know that's your role as the joker and what it allows is like the little bits of truth to squeak through without being you know completely hammered out of existence yeah, I was yeah. hung up on how you started how you started talking, John. You said you grasp onto this seed of truth, the idea that's like your Bitcoin seed, and like that's the form of truth <laughs> that you're like rebuilding logic on. There you, you go. There you go. I uh I sometimes think about you know, I, I understand like people feel like they're being persecuted by Bitcoin. And I I think even like us as Bitcoin acolytes have to admit that uh we have been punished by Bitcoin eternally for dismissing Bitcoin early when we first heard about it. You know what I mean? Like I, I know that I had heard about Bitcoin in 2011 and I was like, ah, oh, nerd money for nerds. Didn't even look into it. Do you know how much like I cost myself and future generations by just being kind of an arrogant dick? A lot, a lot, man. And luckily I course corrected pretty early, but like the longer you go before that, I mean, Bitcoin has existed in the world for 13 years, right? So the longer you go before that course correction takes place, the more accumulated pain. Uh, the it's, you're building up more dead wood around yourself, you know? 
All right. And is that not a form of judgment? Is that not yeah. the very distillation of truth and freedom judging you for not conforming to it or not understanding it or not engaging yes. it in some way? Well, and you're like the hardest on yourself about it too. You're like, I, I like knew and I like felt it. And people are like, no, it's like, okay. And you're like, no, God damn it. It's not okay. <laughs> I want like, I, I'm going to try to speculate about something here because I want to try and connect why people lose their fucking mind, right? They're, you're connected into this hierarchy via your identity, but the whole hierarchy is imagined. And so when someone like Copernicus comes along is like, Hey, your fucking hierarchy's wrong. All the ego self-defense goes into engagement. And if there's too much of that, you get burned at the stake. Right. So, and that's connected to the changes in technology clearly. So what I'm trying to do is tease out the connection between that, the high, the hierarchy. Why is it we have these mythological echoes behind technological revolutions? And I think it's, it's all, comes down to power mm. in, in the sense of the physics sense of energy across time, right? All of these technologies are changing the way we move energy across time. And we know too that the more power, this is like the Lowry thesis to some extent, but the power projection thesis, right? It's also the Kardashev scale. The more energy a civilization harnesses, the more civilized it becomes. So and that's another way of saying the more energy we can harness, that's wealth, right? That's equivalent to wealth. Because if you have cheap energy, you can do anything, create goods and services, et cetera, et cetera. So what we are trying to do in this human enterprise from a physics perspective is to create systems that can tolerate more power projection or, or power storage, perhaps, you know, to harness more energy, ultimately. And the systems historically, like that physical power gets translated into political power, obviously, whoever's pulling the, the levers and there's corrupt, you know, corruption's always been a problem there. Cause once you have a lot of political power, you're, you're incentivized to behave in your own interests at the expense of others and, you know, central banks and all of this, that's basically what it is. So the way I think about this is like, okay, what's the common thread there is we need systems with really strong structural integrity. So this, even at the individual level, like to be really moral, right? To be Marcus Aurelius, he has structural integrity and in that you could vest a lot of political power in one individual and he, he wouldn't be corrupt or he wouldn't bend, bend things in his own favor, for instance. Christianity, right? That, like, again, related to morality, that there's, if you get everyone behaving in this, pulling in one direction, that there's a structural integrity or unity amongst the group. Steel, right? Steel has strong structural integrity. You can put a lot of weight on it. You can build skyscrapers. The skyscrapers have to be built on bedrock, which has a lot of structural integrity. Gold had a structural integrity and in that it was predictable across time. So it could store a lot of wealth and energy in it. And then Bitcoin would be like the ultimate, the most st structurally integrated human construct ever, something like that. And the like cinematic thing I have, if you, if you guys have seen Guardian of the Galaxy, you know, where at the end, the first one where the main character, Star-Lord, I think grabs the purple stone and it's like overwhelming him and it's about to destroy his body. And then he gets, he holds hands with one of the other Guardians of the Galaxy and she takes some of the burden. And then the other one joins hands and finally they all four join hands and they get tolerated together. So like in, in concert, they had more structural integrity as a group to harness more power. And it seems like that's what we've been trying to create in all of our systems. It's like, how do we get the multiplicity inside of one unity in a very structurally integrated way that we can just harness as much energy as possible and become as wealthy as possible? And the best one we've had so far was America, right? We had the decentralized government, gold standard, all these things. Granted, it's a very messed up and corrupt human enterprise and experience still but bitcoin might be you know the next step change in that direction something that you know is more american in spirit than than even the u.s constitution by the way and there's like there's a truth and a lie there where like the truth is that we're structurally uh interdependent on one another true the lie is that we need intermediate intermediaries between us to mm. determine the nature of that relationship Right. And so the more you can strip that away, the closer you get to the truism of the structure. 
Well, and to, yeah. to like be to be fair, like up until the internet, like and it's like yeah, like you need to have these third party institutions. It's important, which I think is one of the big schisms we have with why, uh, like digital immigrants with us being digital natives will always be foreign here, and why mm-hmm. we're coming to this sharp political demarcation that is essentially between like the old who don't understand the internet and the first generation of digital natives who understand that like this is the grounding foundation for a totally new and more civilized civilization and that the internet now allows for us to interact in a peer-to-peer way using advanced cryptography in order to ensure and prove the privacy and secrecy of it like I'm always amazed at how often uh, like I end up doing tech support for older people around me and how much they literally don't understand the logical functions of a computer yeah. or or that it can be trusted to follow those logical functions. They don't have the appropriate mental model. We used to have to, my grandfather was a navigator during World War II, uh, flew combat missions and everything. It, uh, he had a checklist for his computer, like like you would for a flight protocol, right? And he was like, first this, then this, then this. But he never could wrap his uh, brain around the graphical user interface, right? <laughs> like, it just didn't make any sense to him because he had come from a different world. And that's the other thing is, like, we have so many octogenarians running our society. Um, you know, in large degree, that was the COVID response is because they were the most susceptible population and they had the most power. And so they forced us onto this one top-down centralized solution that, like, didn't make sense for the vast majority of us. But it did make sense if you were them. And so, yeah, I think a lot of that tension comes from, you know, the the people who want to shake their fist at the Internet, basically. <laughs> like, mm. You know, that's a great example, actually, because a lot of what we're seeing here is what we've tried to say a lot of things is humans sort of reflect their technological realities. And like right. that, what you just said, that's an example of that in your own life. Like you can see a guy that's from a different mythological echo from a different technological realm, right? Trying to cope with the new one that we're just we're native to. Well, yeah. one other thing I think is so interesting is the egotistical aspect is that like, like when something's not working on the computer, I get like it's fucking broken. Like there's bug, like I can I can work my way through it, and it's not like a personal thing towards me. Whereas so often I'll run into these older people that they get like really fucking mad. They're like, no, like I I typed my password in with no caps. And it's like, look, I get you feel that way. They're like, no, it's it's the fucking truth. And it's like, yeah, well, anyways, the computer believes that there <laughs> is a capitalized word in there. So let's just do that to like move forward. And meanwhile, but, they're like screaming about the whole thing. Right. And I think part of it is, is you can't humble yourself before the technology, which like is kind of a prerequisite of Bitcoin to be able to say, hey, I don't necessarily understand this and I need to allow for myself to be humbled enough to look at it and be able to move forward with I, it from that. By the way, that, that same interaction with my grandfather, he gave me one of the greatest compliments and greatest insults of my life back to back. He was like, you know what? During World War II, you would have been a hell of a fighter pilot back when it was all guts and glory. I was like, what about now, Grandpa? And he was like, now it's all computers and math. You got to be smart. You got to be smart now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the Rob, the, the, the point you made there about different people, like different generations, basically engaging in different reality and, and that being so ultimately divisive because it's not even like they're wrong. Like we would all be super critical about what those octogenarians have done and continue to do. But like the more, you know, in these cases where you spend time with maybe your grandfather or whomever, like you you can kind of appreciate the perspective they're coming from. And I think this somewhat speaks to the importance that that has been placed on the unifying power of the broadest map, right? So like if we can agree on the broadest map, then we create less division based on our circumstances, our age, you know, the environments Mm -hmm. we're engaging in, engaging in, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think that's been that's part of the problem we have today is, is, and, and one of the things I wanted to follow up on Rob, on your analogy to uh, guardians of the galaxy, first of all, great analogy. I love how you used uh, star Lord as his name, but uh, you know, the, the fact that it's almost like m- many, many philosophers and historians have said something to the effect that we've reached a height of technology in the modern world without the like moral capacity to deal with it responsibly. Right. And that's kind of what you're saying. It's like 
if you're going, if you if your material innovation is going to conjure up or develop increasingly, is going to increase your ability to generate and and harness power. You the 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 thing that determines whether or not that's going to destroy you or or lift you up is the the moral refinement of each individual, right? And so in the movie, it's like you know those were all the good guys and they were friends and they had each other's backs and like them joining hands allowed them to you know harness that that power productively. And I again I think this is why the the myths or the stories that that help us engage in the moral dimension of life are indispensable because absent them, we lack not only the the individual integrity as we're saying about like you know each of our actions determining how to use that but in conjunction with one another being able to figure out what, what we're going to do with it and which way we're going to go like and i i see this today you know like one of the things that i think about a lot is the idea of progress and and we all just think like well progress is like star bases on mars right like obviously like that's the height of technological innovation that's what we're all going for like well why is that de facto kind of like the, the understood to be secular progress? Like what if, like, again, this goes back to our perspective. Like what if our perspective was better grounded in what is more meaningful and more true and it generated a different aspiration in terms of progress or what we might be devoting our scarce resources and energy to, you know? And, and as it becomes more abundant, what are we gonna try to amplify? We're gonna just, just try to amplify the complex, complexification of the material world and push out that aspect of ourselves or might there be other means of harnessing or directing our ability to harness energy toward something else and you know it might be the case that we're off track today and all this energy that we're able to harness notwithstanding that would you know there seems to be like a little war against energy at the moment but by and large you know like our increasing innovation and ability to generate and harness energy what, are we, what if we're devoting it to things that ultimately lead to our own demise rather than our own flourishing? And the final uh, thing I wanted to ask you, Rob, in your, I didn't catch it at the time, but your thing with Peterson in Miami, he actually, you were talking about store of value and he said something interesting and he said something to the effect that, you know, your character is your primary store mm -hmm. of value. And what you were saying about being able to harness power and, you know, Marcus Aurelius being, you know, so integrated that he was capable of harnessing and holding and not abusing that power made me think of it. Um, but I'm wondering what, what your thoughts on that statement from him are or were, whether you picked it up at the time or have thought about it since. Yeah, I mean, I, I was inspired to say that by something he had mentioned a long time ago on one of his podcasts, which was he said that reputation was the original store of value. So when we're, we're hunters yeah. and gatherers, one day I kill a mammoth, you know, you don't, I can't eat the mammoth. So I share the food with you. And then in the hopes that next time you'll reciprocate. So that was like the, this original kind of credit transaction was, you know, an original store value. And I mean, there's something to that. I, it's maybe the analogy is a little loose because even store of value, I'm starting to not like that term so much because how can you, you can't really store value. Value is a whole rabbit hole i think we could just yeah let's skip <laughs> so uh, what i would like to say though is the this idea that connection points matter to structural integrity so if we are this animal that's trying to project more energy across time which is the same thing as harnessing more power i don't like how this term power gets polluted with the political all the time i think peterson uses it that way almost exclusively um the stronger those connections become, right, between the constituent elements of whatever it is, your moral framework, your, your steel beam, that's what gives it structural integrity. It's the strength of connection. And so if, we, if we're talking about the imaginal space that humans operate in, it's what you just said, John, it's the common map, right? The more common our map, the stronger our bonds are, which is another way of saying, saying maybe the lower, the more cheap it is to establish trust. Right. If we're both Christians and our parents have known each other for a long time, like we have very common maps. So it'd be very easy for us to do business together or whatever. And it's not just Christianity that does that, but any common map, any common cultural value system. And so, you know, we're in this weird situation as humans that that 
there seems like we're constantly, again, stretching out that imaginal structure and then it's breaking down, right? There tends to be corruption or failure in some respects. We break down. The technology is also changing underfoot all the time. So there's this like really dynamic thing happening that we're like bootstrapping ourselves into civilization. And so we end up with this weird, there's this great quote that says, the main problem with humans today is that we have paleolithic emotions primeval institutions and godlike technology so we like we really are like we're changing so rapidly as a result of both the imaginal changes and the technological changes and then you know but but the i think like the point i guess i was trying to say earlier is that you can't stop that like i think nietzsche was right about a will to power but you have to understand power in the strictly physical sense like you to even be alive is to move energy across time, right? My metabolism is operating right now. I'm thinking, like, I, I am power. Like power is coursing through you to be alive. So the organism itself does have a will to power. It's trying to live. It's the same thing as saying like a will to vitality or something like that. And so if we understand that that is the fundamental pattern of nature and that it's structural integrity that gives us the greatest capacity to harness the most power possible, which is to be as wealthy as possible, then we should really focus on making the connection strong. And there's nothing like, again, back to Bitcoin being this rip through space and time that's connecting time and energy in some perfect platonic form, philosopher's stone way. That's what it is. It's like the ultimate <clears throat> connection between a single unifying form with a multiplicity of people yeah i mean that that map is language right like and that's why we needed a new language in order to establish value around so that like we have such a high focused and pristine map that when we're trying to talk with each other that there is no doubt at all about what is being exchanged between each other yes yeah and there's also- a Norbert Wiener, the cybernetics guy, this one's been haunting mm. me lately. He described organisms as messages. So if you start oh, to wow. think about it that way, that the information that moves through Bitcoin is true, right? And then it moves through you, you're a message, your DNA, your you have this organic blockchain stretching back into the, the dim mist of history. Like that could be the experience, the the veracity of the messaging system that is Bitcoin propagating through the messaging system that is society. Have you guys ever seen the way that uh, ants cross a narrow stream of water? They create a bridge that's made out of the dead bodies of other ants, right? So like hmm. in, a, in a sense, like all human innovation tracks this sort of parallel where like most of it is just pure failure and nobody's finding successful adaptations. And those, so those are the dead bodies of all the ants and that's, the mass that it makes up humanity and most people are you know one of the ants that gets trampled underfoot and then eventually you get a copernicus or a satoshi or a somebody who gets to walk across the bridge because there's been enough accumulated mm-hmm. bodies basically you have enough evidence of what doesn't does and doesn't work so it's like right. each individual life is a message you know Dar- darwinian selection or variation and selection right throwing spaghetti mm-hmm. at the wall to see what sticks Rob, yeah. did, did, was was the point you were just making that the integrity or strength of those connective dots, that connective tissue between either ideas or people or constituent parts of a system is what determines power in a sense? Well, I think the can you, can stronger, we, we, the stronger, the, so friends, I just take it back to property, right? Property is the, the integrity of my, the relationship between me and the things that I create, right. Or justly acquire. If I have a really strong bond, right. It can't be taxed, can't be confiscated. Then that lets the system hold more collective power, right. Which is another way of shifting away from taking and towards making, right. Mm-hmm. This is uh, stronger property rights. Let us generate more wealth. So I guess I'm just trying to put a physics lens on basically the division of labor, right? We know if you have strong property rights, we get more wealthy. Well, what does that mean? That means the whole system is harnessing more energy, right? We're moving more energy across space and time to produce more goods and services due to the structural integrity of the connections, right? Which are right. 
property is between man and nature, basically. Yeah. And, and that idea of the structural integrity between connections, you know, made me think of like, well, you know, what is the, the strongest connection? And if we go out of the physical realm for a moment and go into like the philosophical or religious or emotional, I think it's often been asserted that love is the strongest mm -hmm. connection, right? It's the thing that doesn't necessarily distinguish. It, it's such a strong connection that it doesn't distinguish between the two constituent parts of the connection and considers them a whole, let's say. It's the yes. recognition of a lack of separation. And, you know, you see it in religious story, love God or Jesus or whomever with all thy heart. Uh, and I think, and, and, and love being the highest power as well, love being represent like somehow in a way that we, we can only partially perhaps understand that that being the highest power. And that's why what you said regarding power and the strength of connections made me think of it. But I have also before, you know, thought about Bitcoin in the same way before and that the, the, the parts that make up Bitcoin allow for these connections between the different points in its matrix, the different nodes, the different, you know, users, hodlers in the system. And by virtue of treating everyone the same and not distinguishing or not advantaging one versus another in both how the system operates for them or in the way that their messages are, are transmitted, it would seem to establish relationships that, that almost don't uh, recognize a separation in a certain sense, at least a separation in, in value or, or ideal. Um, and I, maybe there's some relation there of why that allows the system to retain or harness or, or use so much quote unquote power in a sense, but maybe both in the physical and in the uh, metaphysical. Love is such a strange one to me and I, I struggle with it still, but like I listen to your conversations with Braveki and when he describes it, I think he describes it as like right relation or proper relation. Mm. Um, and you know, it's, I can, you almost think like everything we're describing, um, couple of ways to say it maybe it's all darwinian right so everything is variation on selection everything's affecting everything else another when i visualize it's hard to articulate but when i see this visually it's like everything is liquid right Every, everything influences everything else uh, to some extent so love seems to be like establishing the proper relation in that that's that space i suppose um but it's also the unifier of opposites, which I think is like, again, back to the philosopher's stone. Love is what brings together masculine and feminine energy, for instance. Like men and women probably wouldn't want much to do with each other if it weren't for love. It's uh, also maybe treating the other as yourself, too, right? Like that emerges yeah, in, in. Right. And I was again, that say, relates that to the big fruits up into a, it Fruits up that romantic love fruits up into agape, right? Selfless love. And then that is like, we seem to, Christianity wanted to take that form of love, the highest form of love, the parent, the love that a parent has for their child, and almost try to incorporate that into the mythological structure, right? Love your neighbor, treat your neighbor as yourself, do not lie, all these things Christ said. It was, again, trying to create, pretend into existence, a mythological system that has high structural integrity by virtue of honesty and love, right? Like right relation honest propagation of message um yeah and i think you, like, like you can say that the reason why that was sticky and the reason why bitcoin is sticky and works to a certain degree is because <clears throat> not those aren't just nice ideas that it would be great that if we could organize ourselves around them but they're actually true in this metaphysical sense that we've been yes. you know exploring because otherwise they wouldn't work Otherwise, that wouldn't be the, the optimal means on which to organize ourselves. And we wouldn't even be able to determine how optimal they are, right? But the fact that they've proven to be over and over and over again, as, as it's been recapitulated, you know, in prehistory for sure, but certainly since recorded history, it's saying something about all of this that we're engaging in. Yes. And, you know. Perhaps even more instructive is the 20th century when we deviate from those principles, Right. Yeah. We don't need God anymore. Throw out G-O-D, put in G-O-V. We don't need property. Like what happens to the system then? Well, utter, like you can't imagine more evil than in the 20th century. Like it's pretty hard. 
Yeah. It's, the ultimate, it's the ultimate disintegration. Like we've been yes. exploring this concept of integration. It's the ultimate disintegrating of the values or principles that are most conducive to propagating a flourishing, a loving, a trusting, a prosperous culture, community, individual, mm -hmm. et cetera. Well, you know, the, and the 20th century wasn't just like, it wasn't just like, oh, like we like lost mm -hmm. these things that unified. Like the, the abandonment of those things created so many more magnitudes of the possibilities of horrors that like just weren't accessible before, you know, like the kind of total war that was demonstrated in World War One and World War Two was so much more extreme than anything before. And that shit only gets produced when we had these full abandonment of values and, and started to replace the institutions of, you know, as you said, Rob, G-O-D with G-O-V. And, and I think it, that underlines how extreme it is that we need these principles of love and care and helping each other because if we don't have that, we like get this other thing that's really nasty. I've, I've been thinking a lot about the 20th century and some, you know, sort of the Nietzschean prediction of chaos that came to fruition, like Rob was talking about, but then also like our childhoods in the 90s, like that, that was the, that was the culmination, that was the zenith of that mental model. And we were sort of born into it. And so it all seemed normal to us. And then it like 9-11 happens and basically like it just slowly disintegrates. And I think we have just kind of, that was the peak, right? And uh, I don't know where we are now, but certainly we're, we're in a much more degraded state than what it was in the 90s because it just couldn't sustain for whatever reason. Like Berlin, the, the, the 90s were so fucking awesome but it's probably just because i was like a 10 year old and there was because no of gushers super soakers yeah. and gushers, gushers and made it awesome, that awesome <laughs> stuff. super nintendo well, i mean the, the, I think, the fact I think the soviet to, union collapsed then was pretty important right i think we have to recognize too like because you know anyone listening to this is going to say the same and i totally agree that i mean we had an abundance of supposedly religion and god all up to the 19th century let's say and a lot of fucked up shit happened, even a lot of fucked up shit in the name of, right? So clearly mm -hmm. there was some, like, it's not all roses. We're not just trying to say, hey, let's bring back the same thing that we had going on then and everything will be fine. Like things were majorly fucked up, even if they were initiated or predicated on a good idea or good principles or engaging a necessary component of our consciousness in a otherwise, in the best way possible, let's say, I mean, it has, it seemingly has been corrupted and has brought about a lot of things that I think we'd all be fairly critical of, you know? So I think part of our task in these conversations and being alive in whatever era we might, however we might describe this era that we're in, and I don't want to like, you know, presume too much importance on any of our contributions here, but collectively we are a kind of trying to determine a new, I don't I, Mythology is the wrong word because I, I think that's it's got a lot of baggage and uh, it may not be proper. But we're, we're we're trying to formulate a more pristine or more high fidelity map. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's our task. And the the faith is that if we can do that, we will minimize the suffering that people have to experience, and we will maximize the meaning and the flourishing that we have available to us. That's the enterprise. And who knows if we're on the right track, maybe we're headed towards, you know, the, the edge of the waterfall and we're going over, but it certainly seems, and, and may, you know, who, how do we know that it wasn't the case in the past that the, these ideas coming together in the form of the mythological hero, be it Christ or any other one, was similarly revelatory, perhaps not as much because as we've discussed already, like Bitcoin has bridged the gap from the, metaphysical to the physical in a mind-blowing and possibly you know unprecedented way but it, it could still be the case that those relative primitive is not the right word but those people that were contending with a different environment when a certain set of values and principles and ideas came to coalesce and they felt that it mapped on to the met metaphysical better than anything that they've ever had held in their consciousness I'm sure, you know, I could, I could appreciate if it was revelatory. They were like super excited about it. It was like, wow, we, we hacked reality a little bit. We figured, maybe we figured something, a grander truth out. And that's going to enable us to live these more prosperous and meaningful lives that, that we want. 
Um, that could very well be the case, but it went off the rails, obviously, to some degree, at least, uh, even though we might, we might assert that for all of its faults, it would be, maybe we'd be better off if we still had a more religious rather than secular society, you know, in parts of the world today. But anyways, point being that um, Bitcoin just seems to be the, like, that's the thing that's going to capitulate or contribute to the construction of the next map that allows us to save ourselves, allows us to not destroy ourselves and lead us in a direction where we were able to, you know, to the point, Eric, we were discussing earlier, where like we both have the good and evil, right? Runs down through all of our hearts. It'll tilt us toward the good. It'll allow us to extract more of the good than the evil. And that might be our, our, our redemption. That might allow us to survive rather than kill ourselves. And that's, you know, that's the eternal game that we play, perhaps. Yeah, the um, just to maybe tie this in to what we just said about the 90s, like, all right, so we know printing money is the violation of property, right? So it's, if we're printing money, we're corroding the structural integrity that property gives us in civilization. But we also know that it's stimulative early on, right? You kind of, you're kind of like eating the seed corn, so to speak, when you print money. So you can, it can create these economic booms in the short run, but it causes misallocation of capital in the long run. So it's self-defeating. So what if like just this 1970 to 2001 period was just the going off gold boom, right? We finally yeah. untethered ourselves from hard money. We had a 30 year party and the first snap of that artificial bubble was 2001. We saw another one in 2008. Now we had one in 2020. Um, so you have that force that's sort of disunifying or disintegrating the structural integrity of the world and the U.S. more specifically. Uh, and I guess there, the other element there would be, I think Christianity is like ho helping hold it together, right? When I see, when I look at the U.S., the same places are more traditional value, basically. So there's more integrity there. And I think they lend that integrity to the whole of the nation state. So there's these different forces, right? Trying to disintegrate and, and unify at the same time. <clears throat> And yeah, you throw Bitcoin in the middle of it. It's just like the ultimate economic singularity and who knows what happens. And I, I think that's part of the function of traditional values, however they're uh, cultivated or maintained. It's like when chaos emerges, you retreat to the things that are time tested for the uh -huh. longest, right? Like all, all this new progressive social justice philosophy, whatever merit it might have, it hasn't been around very long right so like when when the when chaos re-emerges you go back to being like well what are the things that are more in my control what are the things that have encountered chaos time and time again and have seen people through it you mm -hmm. know and and maybe it's not it's not the total answer to the next stage but it would certainly seem to be the case and i, I see this a lot amongst bitcoiners and you know as you mentioned like christians in the u.s and stuff that you're kind of retreating there's, there's too much chaos. So you're retreating back to those things that you can have a far higher degree of certainty and confidence in. And you're like, you're figuring that out. You're, you're, you're hanging out there while you figure out how to recapitulate and rebuild and, and perhaps more capably confront the new form of chaos that is on the horizon. But I think that's part of the function of, of traditional ways of life and tradition generally. It's like, we've been here before these things help you get through those times when you know the monster of the dragon of chaos re-emerges and the people that recognize that and do that i think are the you know have a far better chance of seeing themselves through it you know productively and then the ones Again, that don't are the ones that become ultimately disintegrated like badly and we're seeing that yeah. all over the fucking place today and I think this is, again, intrinsic to nature. It's how a slime mold grows, right? It kind of shoots these little offshoots at the edges. The ones that succeed, succeed. The ones that die, die. If there's a time of particular bad or starvation, it will retreat back to its core, to its older foundations. Mm -hmm. You do that when you fast, right? You stop eating. Your body, like, gets rid of all the detritus. Anything that, everything gets jettisoned off the ship, so to speak. So that's... I mean, it makes sense that it would it would play out like that. Yeah, well, even in a in a broader scale, I mean, I can't think of anything that exclusively grows without consolidation. 
you know, like yeah. if you look at like plants and fungi and on time lapses and stuff, there's always this like yes. beat, you know, like unstable growth and consolidation, Un undulation. Growth and consolidation. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, maybe all the things we complain about, I don't think you want to give up on the enterprise and in, in consolidating properly and shortening maybe the consolidation time because maybe yeah. consolidation as it's felt by human beings is, is, is turmoil and is, is difficult, but you know, we shouldn't want to not, we shouldn't be hoping that it doesn't exist, right? Because perhaps it's the case that that's how that's how things get built, right? Foundations get older, foundations get further firmed up through each successive round of consolidation, yes. and this is the enterprise of becoming whatever it is our potential is uh, impelling us to become, or or what we're aspiring yeah. to be. And that's where I think maybe the purpose of evil lives. Actually, it's kind of a weird term, but it's kind of like quality assurance testing for the good right like we're trying to create good things but then you enable inevitably create something that does can't withstand one evil guy or girl or guys and girls and so they try to attack the, the structure right and the structure has to prove itself across time to become one of these you know time-tested timeless uh lindy effect approved things to fall back on Mm -hmm. yeah and one of the things you know this is one of the things i've been grappling with lately because you know and again this will trigger a lot of people uh but christianity's had like a good run right let's say almost two thousand years but as we've been exploring if these mythological maps or these metaphysical maps really are determined by the imperatives of our the environment that we're engaging in and the innovation taking place and the possibilities that it represents we've kind of been dancing around this idea that a new new map is required or is currently being uh capitulated or, or formed in some way but still like that that notion of the hero is the one that it balances the stultification of former order with the both threat and potential of chaos right this is like classic peterson and that seems to be eternally true right so the question in my mind is how is that being recapitulated in this environment i mean i think we would all agree that bitcoin has a lot of the characteristics to provide an answer to that question but you know when we when we discuss like how this evolution takes place like that one seems to nail it you need order you need order to confront the chaos but an order allows you to do that, it allows you to be safe, it allows you to be comfortable. But there's a there's a enticement to overemphasize the order and allow it to become pathological or to stultify in some way. And so you need a revivifying force that balances the necessity for the order, but the potential that lies within the chaos. But of course, next to the potential in the chaos is threat, ever present. And so mm -hmm. the the most important idea is the thing that properly mediates between the two. And part of the function of mythological or religious story is not just giving you a set of, you know, an, an articulated value hierarchy to say, hey, like that, you know, truth and freedom and love and these things, meditate on them and maybe you'll come to an answer. It's it's kind of showing, it's an embodied version of, of how that mediating force can act in the world. And I think that's at least partially the power of, of uh, christ in in the christian tradition and i you know like i it seems like things need updating but that that aspect of everything seems still extremely relevant and yeah i'm wondering what you might well think it's like you said earlier if, if, i mean if bitcoin's gonna last as long as we think it is and the bible is a living document who knows? Like Peterson talks about paradise loss that Milton Milton wrote, that it's oh, yeah. effectively become part of the biblical corpus, right? Like we don't call it part of the Bible today. It's a separate book, but there's you see these books coming together because it's really what Bible means. It means library. So it's this collection of books. It's not any one book. So maybe over these longer spans of time, you know, like Hodel said earlier. Remember that guy we killed 200 years ago? Like he had some really good ideas. <laughs> Maybe we start stuffing some of that into the biblical corpus over a long enough time frame. And I don't, what, what does that mean? Does the white paper get included at some point? I don't know. 
heavy trip. Or we're all just crazy cultists. That's the alternative. <laughs> Time will tell. We will definitely find it's, that out. I, you know, sometimes when I'm listening to these conversations and I'm participating in them, you know, I'm thinking to myself, either people will be studying this podcast 500 years from now, or people will be looking back at us five years from now being like, look at these fucking pseudo intellectual grifters. Like, <laughs> oh, I don't I'm know sure, which I'm one sure it is. a lot of people think about us that way right now you don't have to wait five years. they do well certainly they do but i think i think they're wrong they're either wrong or we've stumbled into you know it's kind of like in some sense i think that when the history books are written on covid if they're accurate they'll they'll detail it as the first uh social media mass hysteria because you talked about like baby boomers not being able to like deal with technological changes well everybody had a device that beamed fear directly into their pocket that was the first time that had ever happened right it corresponds directly with COVID that didn't happen during swine flu, SARS, whatever. Right. So like, I'm thinking to myself, okay, if, you know, historically they're going to uh, say that about COVID, maybe if Bitcoin fails, they'll say that this was like, the first mass delusion of the internet age or something like that. And uh, listen, I'm prepared for whatever outcome. When you get into Bitcoin, you have to be prepared for billionaire status or homelessness like you you'll be sleeping on a beach but you don't know in a mansion or in a sleeping bag that's just the journey baby and you don't know how your reputation is going to be upheld whether you're going to be seen as a visionary genius uh iconoclast or as a crazy homeless guy sleeping on a beach <laughs> one of the two you know buy the ticket take the ride yeah, hundred percent. Hey man, 100%. Take, take, taking a roll of the dice is better than uh, for for going the game, right? At least so we, we're not with we're not with the cold and timid spirits that hold themselves aside at the table. They know yeah, yeah, what's like the uh, my shitty job? Yeah, it's like the the Teddy uh, Roosevelt quote about uh, yeah, you know, those in the arena. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe at a minimum. Like, because I was going to say something to the effect that yeah, but our hearts were in the right places, right? And we were we were trying to. You know, we're trying to contribute to the good, let's say. But maybe yeah. even if that's not the case, like maybe there's at least something endearing about us, you know, that we're having these types of conversation and we're not just talking about Lambos and fucking yachts and bitches and that kind of stuff. Like maybe historians will at least be like, you know what, they were totally insane and wrong, but yeah, they were nice guys. You know, they weren't so bad. <laughs> there was way worse in the fiat era. Uh, Do you guys think- Take a look we, at the Lonely Island do you guys what, think things go quiet soon? I've been kind of wrestling with this lately, partially because of it kind of welling up inside of me. But like, do you think, um, I don't know, do you think things quiet down in Bitcoin land and just, I guess, in terms of Twitter and content and stuff? Or is this just a, a train that keeps on gathering speed? Um, I, I personally don't feel the call i can only speak about myself but like i just don't feel the call to engage with as much bitcoin content anymore because yeah i'm pretty solidified in my you know thoughts opinions views 100 percent of my net worth is in bitcoin i That's think a lot I'm of yeah i think a lot of me there was a time period from like uh 2018 to like 20 early part of 2020 where I was listening to like seven Bitcoin podcasts and I only inhaled Bitcoin content. And that was all I read. And I blocked out all other, you know, everything else about the world and all my social relationships with Bitcoin. And now it's not quite that way. And I think, it, I think I was gaining courage to have a hundred percent allocation to Bitcoin. And that's why I was so uh, enmeshed in Bitcoin content and podcasts and everything. But, you know, the fundamentals of Bitcoin don't change and the big questions are left unanswered. So like, I don't know, man. Maybe it's like uh, I've just been here so long, but uh, a lot of these conversations are repetitious for me at this point. So I just I don't feel the need to engage as often. You know, that's just me, though. I don't, no, I don't know how it is for exactly, everybody else. That's exactly why I ask. You know, I, I listen to way less content than I used to. And I am more serious about asking myself the question, like, well, what is the more valuable use of my time here? Is it right. engaging on Twitter? Is it having another conversation that people have heard a million times before is it like actually something that i value that it would be a productive use of the time to move towards that or something um and that's why i asked the question like because i think i mean it depends when you got into the space and the learning curve and all that kind of stuff but 
if you are all in, you get the thesis, you're ride or die, you're going down with the ship, like, it's, like how does that change the nature of all the stuff that's being said? I mean, new people come into space, you start a podcast, you write a book. There's maybe there's some like novel stuff being generated and that would be the signal. And I think that that gets justified attention, but a lot of it's like, you know, you're hearing from the same people and same conversations and all this yeah. stuff. And Rob, like I kind of single you out a little bit here because you seem to find uh, a lot of guests for your show that don't pop up anywhere. They're, they're pretty novel. And I actually like, I want to, one of the questions I want to ask you is like how you, how you find all these people, but, but still like, uh, I think for those of us who who get it, our or my mind is being tuned toward like, well, what's the next step? Like we've mm. we went through the step of like, as you said, Hoddle confirming your your thesis and you know gaining the confidence to go all in and like adjust your perspective in that way. What's the next step? And I I do think a part of it, at least for me, is this type of a conversation because for me a, mm. a big part of the next step is like really pushing the bounds on what kind of meaning this thing contains, you know, and, and because I want that extra clarity to help me determine what my action should be. So I find like, you know, some of these <laughs> conversations that I have with people beneficial to me for that reason, but I can, but I, I, I just send, I, I'm, I find myself less interested in all the goings on in the space, let's say. I, and, you know, not, not, not criticizing anybody. Cause I love like so many of the people that are doing stuff in the space, but I was just curious about your guys' attention and where you found it drifting these days. Um, <clears throat> I feel, I guess maybe just to describe the pathway, <laughs> common pathway that I see is like, you get, you hear about Bitcoin. If you pay enough attention to understand that it's like actually something useful, then you might start to go down the rabbit hole, but then a lot of people hit the sticking point. Government will never allow it, right? And they still kind of have government either at or near the top of their own worldview, their hierarchical worldview. Mm. And so that can cause a lot of people to just stop there, right? Like I put, a, I put a Ray Dalio in that bucket. He kind of gets really stuck on that point. But then once you realize Bitcoin's unstoppable, <laughs> it doesn't matter um, what the government does to stop it. There's no, like that's the, no one knows how to stop it, basically. You start to fall really far and fast down the rabbit hole because the implications, this is like even what Peterson says. He says, he's thought through it. The implications are so unbelievably radical that he just uses that notion that the probability is probably low of its that success. That's so funny in your chat with him. Like the reason why he doesn't <laughs> fully buy into it is because it's too, it's too good to too be radical, true, basically. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so clearly I would say we're all well, we're falling far and fast down that rabbit hole. And for me, the content, I've never been a huge audio video guy at all. Like I listen to maybe one podcast a week, something like that. Not, not a lot. I prefer to read. Um, so I don't, early on in Bitcoin, I did listen to a lot of podcasts because there's a lot of useful information you're trying to figure out you know all the things but once you get to this kind of i guess simplistic maximalist viewpoint of just it's all bitcoin and nothing else that uh i find myself like the book we're reading like the history of religious ideas who would have thought by studying some magic internet money you'd end up reading the you know history of religious ideas. it's not something i would have ever thought i would ever read in, in a thousand years so I really enjoy that now. Like I feel very grateful to be able to be falling fast and far down the rabbit hole and talking to people that I think are interesting about things that I think are interesting. Like I'm trying a lot of the things we talked about today, right? These are things that I'm trying to figure out and put into words. You kind of have this dim apprehension of a thing, you know, where you can sort of maybe see a pattern, but then you have to figure out how to get that pattern again, pull that imaginal structure down into articulable speech is a really it's a challenge so uh i enjoy that a lot and i i just feel really grateful to be able to do it for a living it, yeah. it's amazing so when, when i mean i hate to ask but when book speaking of articulate you know distilling this stuff down and articulating it and how hard it is 
How's the book coming along? I want to have it out by the end of the year, but it is honestly, it's like I would start to try and say something and then you get to a point, you get to your own sticking point where you realize you don't have a fully formed way to yeah. say it. Or, and so a lot of these things I've been thinking, like trying to connect the technological to the mythological domain, you know, Iliad helps with that a lot. Mm. How it is the nature, you know, I, I want to ground it in physics, right? If I'm going to write about history of money and transformation of society, I want to ground it in something that will really re hopefully resonate with kind of a mainstream audience. And for me, I just think, you know, physics and math are as best, best we can do. So that's why I'm trying to disambiguate this, you know, where Peterson's often talking about political power. I think he overlooks the physical nature of power and how, it, how essential it is. Again, to be alive is to be expressing energy across time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope, <laughs> just a mildly ambitious attempt to try and um, undermine central banking from the first principles of physics <laughs> something like that yeah I mean nice. like, one of the things I've encountered myself is like you think you're on a thread of like articulating that poorly defined or just not perfectly defined idea in your head but then, you know, through these conversations and through reading of these books and stuff, you get such a shift that it shifts the whole thread and all the, the you know, not maybe not all of it, but it, it requires reworking things sometimes to a fairly large degree. And, um, you know, you really, really got to have a, like a, the right emotional approach to the process to not be thrown off course by that, because you know, at least for me, I'm finding it like part you know large part of my effort in writing is trying to calm myself down basically it's trying to yeah. be, be like stay calm you know think <laughs> trust in the process don't don't try to rush it but it's tough man like you think you think things are so well formed here right because it's how you live right like of course yeah. it's got to be like well formed and then you ha try to have it come out through your fingertips and you realize and this is almost what's scary about it because you realize like how conscious are you of your perspective and your worldview and, and what's guiding you. If you can't articulate it well, and this is part of Peterson's point about becoming a writer, but if you can't articulate it well, like, are you fully conscious of it? To what degree is your perspective unconscious? And this is a massive thing in the world today. I mean, between your, fa your familial and your nation and your government conditioning and social media and all that kind of stuff, I mean, how, how conscious are you of the different constituent components of your perspective? And, and is it not a good thing to be maximally conscious of them so that you can be maximally, you can be maximally in control. You can maximally assert your, you know, your free agency. It's a weird thing with the writing. Cause you're, I feel like I'm constantly <clears throat> trying to figure out what I'm trying to say. So it's more of like an inquiry, like a yen, right. but then you try to say it too. So you actually have to like make a point, but you don't want to, you know, you have to reinforce your claims and all that. So it's this constant, like in and out in and out and it's just a painful process well just just vomiting the insight is easy right just mm -hmm. having the epiphany come and typing it out not even really thinking about it but as you say putting it in a structure that's going yeah. to flow and and stay integrated as you move through the different parts that's the the tricky part and i tend mm -hmm. to fail fall or fallen short in that direction i would just kind of state the insight and then i get a lot of feedback when people read the work that get the ideas of like, well, you know, expand on this. What do you mean by that? And so one right. sentence that I might've put out could turn into three paragraphs trying to justify the, the point. So yeah, it's good to have other eyes on it too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I find my writing style and my reasons for it are pretty different from other people. Like I'm not interested in trying to contact a wider audience. And I also think what I'm trying you know, my opinion is what I'm trying to articulate is one of the most difficult things to articulate. So like, it's not, it's not going to come in this, you know, fun, you know, small, little, easy to digest book. Like I, my pursuit of writing, like, I think I'm dealing with the most difficult and the most essential aspect of Western metaphysics. And so like, I don't think that this is going to come as like an easy explanation. And I don't, and like, there was never like, 
let's like set out on a project to like make Bitcoin the object of Western metaphysics. No, like it just fucking happens that like that seems to be what I've stumbled upon. And I, I really wish I didn't feel haunted by this need to try to explain it, but I keep coming back to it. I think it was uh, Kurt Vonnegut once said, like anybody can write a book. It's just like trying to, to pump up a hot air balloon with a bicycle pump. You know, like it's just it just takes fucking a long time and it's hard. Yeah, but I, I agree with, with your point about the audience. I mean, I think I've said this before, too, but like it, it's it's purely to have a, a more clear grip on on the thing that seems to be most influential in my perspective currently. Like, I want to know more. I want to have a, a better grip on that, because like, you know, a conversation like this is pretty emblematic that we're all like we're grasping, you know, maybe we've gotten somewhere with it, but you know, there's a lot of things to be determined. And if we are at all right about how meaning works in consciousness and how we ascribe meaning and the things that influence meaning and all this stuff we've been talking about, then getting a clearer perspective on it would probably necessitate positive outcomes in your life. You know, and that's my primary purpose. I want to have like a thing that I can go back to and, you know, help me recapitulate my perspective as as i go through time i mean you know, so. the way that you say want like like i don't want to be like wait like you guys you guys are like in control here like like i don't i don't feel like i have any power around this like it's like a it's like a barbed hook in my brain and like this is just this is just what i have to do now like there's not <laughs> There's not really like an option around it. Well, good. Yeah, and just to be I mean, clear, like I don't enjoy reading a lot of this philosophy. Like I find it really hard and difficult. Yeah. And I have to like learn all of this like Latin and yeah. Greek and shit. Like, like this sucks. But like I try to go away and then I'm like, so like what did fucking Schmidt say? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, the the political as the strongest, the most intense distinction of category. Like this makes sense. Yeah, like more. And I'm like, yeah, but wait, but like why? I'm fucking crazy. So why is that satisfying? Why, when you go back to Schmidt and you figure out what you're saying and you integrate it into your existing perspective, why is that satisfying? Because like, I think I'm kind of crazy. And then like, I reconnect the points. I'm like, oh, I'm not crazy. And like, it's this kind of constant oscillation back and forth. And then it's hard to like stop and like objectively be like, oh yeah, like, you know, like internet money clearly is like the object of Western metaphysics. That's going to like rescue us all from what we need. And then like, when I try to go like, whoa, hang on, stop, Eric. Like, is the, is that true? Like, is Bitcoin actually this thing that fundamentally changed your life and made it better and empowered you and helped you? And it's like, oh, yeah. Like, even though this all sounds absolutely insane, it's like true. So like, let's right. continue with trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, but aside from like your desire to prove to yourself you're not insane, like, why do you think it is that triangulating in on a, a greater clarity around the truth is so compelling to you? Uh, and all, like, I, I think it's the same thing that's drawn everyone from all different fields to however they come to that truth too. Like it's just part of our own makeup of how we're attracted to certain things or why we do things. You know, like I, I think almost a better comparative is like people that do extreme sports that like, you know, maybe get in situations where they die. Like, even though there's a very readle, ready knowledge in front of them that they could die doing this thing, they're just so enamored by it. Like, I don't, I, it's like a moth to a flame thing. Like it, it, it's, it's weird, you know? And, and actually that's a good analogy because I feel like I turn away and I like look into all of the darkness. And I'm like, oh God, it's like so fucking bad out here. And I like turn back to philosophy and particularly with like Heidegger and a few others, they help be like, yeah, like, like cool your jets. Like it, it's supposed to be really, really, really fucked up right now. Like that's how it works. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess like it, it helps me remediate the difference between the darkness of the external world and seeing this light that's so different and yet it's still very small and nascent and so it's almost like this question of that like is this truly a light that's saving or not and like is my pursuit towards it because like as I've gone towards it like I have to say like my own life has gotten better and more interesting and I'm happier and all this other stuff but it's very strange you know but it, it I seems think to be uh, what it is 
I think in my, cause I'm a relentless, you know, truth seeker also as we all are. And, uh, I, I think for me, it's about stemming, um, the compounding of pain because when you have lived a lie for a long time, the pain compounds and uh, the exponential goes the wrong direction. And when the bill come due, comes due eventually, as it always does, the pain is many orders of magnitude greater than it should have been. And I just uh, personally from my younger years cannot stomach that. And uh, I see a lot of people who, you know, essentially their entire life is off course because they refuse to engage with the truth. And I know that for most of them, there's this very, very, very painful bill that comes due when they're on their deathbed and suddenly the crushing realization that they wasted their entire life hits them like a ton of fucking bricks. And there's nothing you can do but stare up at the ceiling and slowly die. <laughs> Fuck that. Like, so for me, it's all about just avoiding that moment uh, at the very end. I think that's what's compelling about the truth and why I was, you know, kind of digging into it here because we've been operating with this idea that they're like, there is a reality, both physical and metaphysical to conform to, right? That kind of determines how much pain to your point, Hoddle, we're going to experience. The greater conformity to it, the less pain, the less conformity to it, the more friction, the more mistakes, the more pain. And so truth would seem to be that thing that allows you to become more integrated with those, those domains. Right. And I think the reason why we, we, we seek it more and more and why it's wrapped up in all the topics we've been discussing today is because it, it fosters that integration and it resolves the tension or the pain to be derived from not being congruent with the things that determine outcomes, the things that determine emotions, the things that determine what you experience. And, um, and to the point where like the most profound truths, and again, this you know, find it in poetry and theology, et cetera, is like the thing that resolves everything, right? The thing that allows everything to be perfectly integrated, the all resolving power of the truth or love or, you know, other synonyms there. And uh, I think that's what's so, that's what makes it so compelling, right? It's like you get a little sniff of it and you, and to your point, we've all mentioned this, like how much Bitcoin has improved our lives in a number of different domains. And that's just confirming the enterprise where it's like, I got to keep going. Like if I, if I, if I still have a scent on that trail, I got to keep going because the results are, are amazing. And I want to see more of them for myself and I want to see more for other people as well. But there's something just so compelling or intoxicating or fulfilling, meaningful about what we call what we, the word we use to describe it as truth you know, and, and the kind of the congruence that, that, that if you pursue that properly seems to foster, or if you pursue it in relation to the right thing, because maybe you're pursuing it in relation to the wrong thing. And maybe that takes you even further off in the wrong direction, but yeah, I just, uh, it seems Eric, like everyone, any... go ahead. Sorry. Um, I mean, it seems like given the choice, not that everyone probably s steps back from their lives to make the choice, but if you really think about it, I think everyone would choose to live their life ordered to truth because if you chose to live your life ordered to falsehood. You're basically volunteering for that exponential accumulation of pain that Hodel's describing, right? The, the longer you live in a lie, the more you're diverging from reality and you know, there's going to be a day of reckoning, right? It's just not, that's what the truth is. It's everywhere. You can't avoid it. And so, you know, maybe this you know, there's in that I have a series coming out soon on platonic philosophy, but they talk about this key connection between human reason and love, how they both seem, they both seek right relation with reality. And I know, <clears throat> John, when you talked to Graveki, he talked about reversing the arrow of relevance, right? That we typically, you come into the world and you're like, how is the world relevant to me? You're always trying to like, you're selfish, basically, you're, you're immature, you're trying to become a fully grown adult right and in that process there's a lot of uh limited let's say myopia you just you don't understand the the relevance of yourself to the world so much but then in coming into adulthood especially like if you had kids or something you 
it's that love again that agopic love that reverses the arrow of relevance now you're like how am i relevant to my children how am i relevant to others to the world and man it's just really again back to bitcoin being the unity of opposites like it's turned to that selfish pursuit for individual accumulation right wealth accumulation wealth preservation to a really selfless outcome so you know it, it's it seems like it helps us reverse the arrow of relevance and that's probably what we're kind of all describing here is the improvement in our lives now for me it's hard to disentangle because i got into bitcoin and had a daughter kind of at the same time so i guess i've been going through through both uh, influences simultaneously, but it definitely, that's been the experience for me going, my darker self was much more self-seeking overall, right? I was like, what's in it for me? That kind of mode of being. And now it feels like Bitcoin and perhaps being a father as well has really helped me reverse that. And it's a good feeling. Like it's a really good feeling. I highly recommend it to anyone. And, you know, credit to Peterson, right? Pursue responsibility, not happiness. That's how you get to that that stage of, of being that's much more what we are evolved to be, I think. You may have just answered this and we'll shut it down shortly after this, Rob, but like, what is it, I, the, the other two and myself have kind of touched on this, but like when you're putting in the work writing and it's frustrating and you just, you know, you just push yourself through it or you have a big schedule and you're trying to get work done and balance with family life and all that kind of stuff. Like aside from the means to continue on your life, right? Like income and stuff. What is it? Do you, is there something you're hoping to find at the end of, you know, this pursuit of what is money or what is Bitcoin? Because obviously it's, it's compelled you to pursue it. Right. And so is, is it, is it conscious? What lies at the end of that pursuit? Like what's motivating it? Um, you know, the word unity comes to mind, really. Like, aren't we all just, hmm. it's weird again, because like I said, when you're writing, you're sort of, what are you trying to write about? And then you're trying to make a point. So you're kind of asking me like, what is the big point I'm trying to make? Yeah. And yeah, I guess you could like say, fix the money, fix the world. Right something really simple like that, that we already have crystallized in the Bitcoin community. But hopefully saying it in my own unique way that resonates with people in a unique way. And um, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess the point would be fix the money, fix the world, but the, the delivery and the, the form of how I deliver it, I hope well, to do that in a way that's very thoughtful and resonant with a lot of people. I, I know it's like a super hard question to answer because even something like fix the money, fix the world is more of a means, right? And so I guess my question is like, what is the ultimate end to be seeking? You know, and unity is the word that came to your mind. But again, like to bring all this full circle, I think this is part of the power and the role of metaphysical narrative in the human story. Is it because like it, uh, it presents or is a reflection of like the ultimate ends. Like, yes, take care of your family and yes, you know, love your neighbor and be part of a community and try to execute the values that you think are, or propagate the values that you think are most important in the world. But like, how do you, what do you, what is that taken to the ultimate extreme? What is the, the end that is most worthy of your sacrifice, right? Because as you said before, every time you take an action, you're always, giving away you're always spending time and energy yeah. you're always exerting power what is the end most worthy of sacrifice and it would seem that these stories like once you peel back the onion a little bit it is something to the effect of you know love god with all your heart sort of thing and mm -hmm. allow that to be uh allow creation to manifest through you as a result of that orientation something like that yes and, yeah like, I don't know what that fucking, you know, means in a day-to-day -day life. We're all figuring that out, but it seems like, I mean, yeah. if whether that's the proper articulation of the answer, it seems like that realm is trying to, to suppose one at least. When I was a kid, the meaning of life was put to me as people helping people. Right? Like no matter what we're doing, like it's kind of 
it's where you get the most meaning is to just be relevant to someone else's life, you know? And um, this experience of getting into Bitcoin, and especially when you go to a Bitcoin conference and we get, you know, we get mobbed with love, basically. People saying how much it helped them. That's a great feeling. So you just kind of like mining value and then creating value for others, hopefully. And yeah, if I can help people, I guess that would be the end, right? I, uh, for me personally, like the, the kid thing is huge. I mean, um, when I had my daughter, my first daughter is sitting playing her iPad over there. Uh, I had this like really tough childhood. I had like pretty traumatic childhood. My mother was schizophrenic and things were difficult. And when I had this child, I realized to myself, like my whole life came to like the, you know, through the eye of a needle. And it was like, if anything had been different, if anything had been out of place, it would have been a different child. Mm. And I was so clearly meant to have this child. And I don't need to ask myself like the meaning of my life because in that moment, it's never been more clear and it's been clear every day since my job is to fight for her and make the world right for her and set things in order and give her more than I was given. And I think collectively, like, especially that's part of the Bitcoin story is uh, the baby boomers leveraged our future. And they stole from the future to have a party in the present that none of us participated in. And we're one of the first generations where we threw an error. And in the blockchain of humanity, we were given less than, than the prior generations. You're supposed to give your children more. That's the natural order of things. And so Bitcoin writes this, this system and it pushes value into the future rather than extracting value from the future for the present. Because the future is always more valuable than the present is. And so to me, like that is all wrapped up in what we're doing here. And I just go forth every day thinking about that. And uh, yeah, man. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the, this for me represents us being able to participate in building a system where we can bow to the future ones who come a millennia from now and say, we love and respect you enough that we secured the wealth of the future for everyone forever. Because we know that the, this truly is a sacred task to make sure that the theft of money and wealth can no longer occur in our world with our technology and that we were ones to do it. You know, and to me, it's, uh, it's the realization that in a nihilistic world where God is dead, God, God actually needs us more than we need him. And in meeting his request for his need, we can raise ourselves to his task, which is to create a world that he wants reflected in his image. And I firmly and fundamentally believe that's a world where all people have the self-sovereignty of their wealth for themselves and only themselves. And it's not because we just want to give that, but that's the responsibility of self-love and self-care that when I give it to you, I receive it in kind and that I love you as I love myself. And I raised you the other to the metaphysical position that only you can give me. And that's the recovery from this place. That was I love that you said in kind, because that word kin, it's in kind. It's also in kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. Again, back to the strength of the integrity of relations, right? There's no stronger bond than between kin. And the kingdom of heaven is supposed to be that, right? Global family. Like, obviously, it's never going to be real, but we can, this is what we do. We use our imagination to create these things, and then we live in them. So it seems like Bitcoin might be a big step towards the kingdom of heaven. Indeed. Seems like a good place to end it. Ah, love you guys. I miss you all. Am I, is it just going to be love Miami next year? Is that, that when we all get together again? I mean, I'll be in Austin at the end of this month. I don't know if you guys are going to be there, but I'll see you there. Yeah. You'll be there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, for, dope. For BBB? BBB. Yep. And then um, I don't know if I'll be there, but I will be in LA for Pacific Bitcoin Conference. All right, cool. I'll see you at that one, too. Speaking November. of that one, too. Yeah. Well, Should I John? Probably won't, oh. I probably won't be there until Miami or until things become a little bit more sane, but I'm sure we'll... Uh, We'll hang out in the flesh again sometime soon. Fuck yeah.
Right, love you, Aspen. Love you. Love right, you I will see I'm you in Austin. See you guys. Rob, I'll see you in LA. See you guys.